My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. with God so it is their blessings that brings credence to what we do so this morning we are specifically thankful to God and grateful to our fathers for honoring us with their presence can you please give the Lord a big hand for them This morning we don't have so much time, so we'll be trusting the Lord to do a quick walk and to cut it short in righteousness. Hallelujah. Can you hear me at the back? Lift up your hands and worship the Lord one more time. The glory of God is already enveloping this place. The glory of God is already enveloping this atmosphere. Yes, some of you may not be able to sense this yet. Maybe because your antenna in the spirit is not very strong. We will heighten it in the course of the service. We will heighten it. But for those who can perceive the glory, can you please give God the honor? Can you worship Him one more time and talk to Him? something from the depths of your heart. Salute the eternal excellency, the monarch of Zion. Acknowledge him for his love, for his kindness. Give him thanks for the gift of life. Give him thanks for the possibilities that he has factored in your direction. Has made it possible for you to be numbered among the righteous. There are many persons that have not even heard the gospel. You are saved, you know the Lord, you walk with Him. Can you give Him thanks? Give Him thanks for bread and water. Give Him thanks for your family, for life, for your friends, for the resources that He has navigated in your direction. Give Him glory. Rahamanta Prahila Kondra Paragadiscus. Selom Ranatas Kavila Barandra Dadisco Prahala Gabaria. Rehinanta pare kundre mara aktavalo zozondre mara aspis. Go ahead and talk to the Lord for the healings. The healings that will be taking place this morning. For the healings, for the healings. Many will be healed. Give him thanks 
sobre él. Praise, we give you glory. We ask that you descend upon us this morning like a cloud of glory. Cause that even as we interface with your presence, the ambience of your presence will travel into our spirit man and it will cause a quickening on our inside that we may ascend to the heights of Zion and receive strength by your grace. You will bring us to that point where we will behold you for who you are and be transformed. Cause that, Lord, on the strength of our interaction with you this morning, our spirits will be made perfect. We ask, O oh God, that you bring us clear cut insight and direction as touching your counsel for our ordinations. Many who have walked in darkness, Lord, I ask that tonight you will bring illumination, you will bring direction. You bring insight. You bring perspective. Many who are weak, Lord, we ask that you bring strength. So that the least among us will become as strong as David. They call the glory, Father. We thank you because of the mighty things you'll be doing in our midst this morning. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, we are back to continue from where we stopped last night. By the way, I brought messages of my father in the Lord, Apostle Arumel Osai. I bring you greetings from him. And I also brought some of his messages to strengthen your spirit. You see, the ministry of the last day is different from the normal church that you know. I was telling us last night how that, how that the Calvary that we bear the cross in the last day will be carried on the shoulder of proclaimers. And I told you that proclaimers are different from teachers. They are different from preachers. They are communicators of the heart of God to the heart of men. You may tag your meeting to be about spiritual education. But when the proclaimer comes, that day what may be in the heart of God may be to furnish a body for evangelism. So even though your teaching or your expectation may be to give you an exegetical expression of a Bible or of a doctrine, at the end of the day when the proclaimer finishes talking, everybody will catch the body for evangelism. And it is on the strength of the ministration of a proclaimer that a revival is possible. The messages he, he preaches, they are all trances of a proclaimer. You will hear there are many things you may not understand because of the depth. But after some time you discover that God will be deposited in your heart. He may not be teaching you the outlay of the doctrine of righteousness. But you hear for some time and you discover that sin will be tamed in your life. Because it's the utterance of a proclaimer. And another thing you need to know is that in the fivefold ministry, each of the offices have definite clear cut perspective and sight in the spirit when a teacher looks at the scripture what he sees is different from when what a prophet sees when he looks at the scriptures and when a prophet looks at the scriptures what he sees is different from what an apostle sees in the scriptures and that is why god galvanized the five offices together to bring us accurate perspective of the will of god as touching his dealings for different dispensations. A teacher has insight. The kind of sight he has into the things of God is such that he understands the intricate possibilities and the intricate wisdom of God that guides the workings of a believer. So when he talks to you, he brings you insight, revelations as to the will of God by time. A pastor has oversight. So when a pastor teaches, what he does is that he gives expression to the entire counsel of God so that there will be a balance in your life. And that is why the, ministry, the pastoral ministry is very important. Most times when you listen to a pastor, you may think he's a psychologist. The idea is because 
He will just touch here and there, little here, little there, so that there will be a balance in your life. What he sees, his kind of sight, is what we call oversight. An evangelist has what we call hindsight. When an evangelist ministers to you, he takes you back to the cross. You may have been, you have gone far in life, you are 50 years old. When you listen to an evangelist, you go back to the cross because as far as our work with God is concerned, the cross is the divide. The cross is where an end came and the beginning began. The cross is the sign that life can come out of death. So the duty of the evangelist is to take you back to the cross so that you can subscribe to a new possibility in God and a new economy of life will begin to work in you. The job of the evangelist is to provide hindsight. That's why most of the time you see them doing all the altar calls. They want to bring you back to the reference where life has meaning. A prophet gives foresight. When you meet a prophet, he tells you a step to take and how to walk so that you can be captured within the confines of safety. And if you are not careful, if you live with a prophet for a long time, you become a babe. If all you listen to is a prophet, you become a babe. Because he will tell you everything you need to do. So if you go to prophetic ministries, most of the time, if they want to travel, they ask the prophet, should I travel today? There's no strength in their spirit. The job of the prophet is to give you foresight. This is how you, you walk. This is where you go. So prophetic ministry can only be balanced by the ministry of a teacher. But when an apostle teaches, he gives long sight. The doctrine of the apostolic is such that they bring you to a point where you have relevance in eternity. When an apostle talks to you, what is the burden in his heart? It's not just for you to prosper in this life. You know, a pastor can teach you, say, give, it shall be given unto you. That's his emphasis. If you give, you will become big. God will reward you. But when an apostle begins to talk to you, he will tell you to give so that the kingdom can advance. You may, not, you may never hear him tell you, give, it shall be given unto you. Because the burden in his heart is not primarily for you to survive in time. The burden in his heart is for you to be relevant in eternity. Because by reason of the kind of anointing that works in his life, he has come to realize that life has no meaning apart from eternity. You can gain the whole world according to the words of Jesus. But if you lose your soul, everything you caught life was a waste. The job of the apostolic is to bring men to a point where they are relevant in their ordinations. The messages I am bringing to you, they are messages of an apostle. Most of the things you love doing before now, they will die. If you hear me. You know, the, 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 the bad thing is that, the difficult thing is that God speaks at different energy levels. For those of you who are chemistry students, you understand what I'm saying. The reason we take time to pray and worship is so that people can come up to a higher energy level where they can pick the whispers of Zion. Because you can come for a meeting, people are hearing things, they are crying, and you, you sit like this, say, what did they happen now? What did they talk? Mm, me, I'm tired. The problem is that your spirit man is rusty. You can't hear at that energy level. But the people that were able to hear at that energy level, what happens is that they have excited. When an electron receives energy, what happens is that he jumps higher. They excite to a higher energy level. And sometimes the glory they begin to trap at that time, they cannot contain it. So some of them go under the power, they are slaved. You see, these this, this cables you are seeing now, if we increase the voltage, the wire will melt. The reason it will melt is not because it's not a conductor, it's a conductor, but it cannot manage that height of voltage. So the reason you see people fall under the power is because they are interacting with an unction that is superior to what their system is used to. But the beautiful thing is that when God encounters you like that, He begins to work a new protocol in your life. For God to increase Adam, He had to slay him. And when Adam slept, He removed his sleeve and He formed a woman. So sometimes when God slays people in a meeting, it's because He wants to do something that is bigger than them. Tonight, or this morning, something will come upon your life. I pleaded with them yesterday to open their hearts to be yielded. They didn't know what was coming in their direction. They thought it was teaching as usual. And most people, it was when the meeting was rounding up that they realized that what was happening was beyond what they knew. I was told that we left here around 9. I was told that the power of God was still moving to 12. You know, those people, it was later that their spirit opened. When God had gone far, that was when they caught up. And because of the economy of mercy, the presence of God was still here. Till 12, three hours after the meeting, God was still touching people. We don't have the luxury of time this morning. So go ahead and tell God to open your heart.
He said, enlarge your coast. Stretch forth the, court, the, the boundaries of your habitation. Let God, tell God your heart is open. You are ready. Let him minister to you. It's not necessarily about the level of education that will bring your direction. It is about the supply of the spirit. Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profited nothing. It is the spirit that quickens. Can you ask the Lord to minister to you? Talk to Jesus. That's what I said. Talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Your words were given to you to chart the course of your life. When you need to talk, talk. Because spirits move in the direction of your utterance. If you say, Lord, the Bible says you are saved. That means salvation will only come in the direction of that utterance. Spirits travel in the direction of your utterance. Tell God to minister to you this morning. You may not have time to do so much of teaching. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You are seated on the throne. Hallelujah. Glory to the says but none of these things move me he said neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to 
testify of the gospel of grace. You see, Paul had to go through a long plethora of words to give you insight as to the factors that will qualify him and give him the capacity to testify of the grace of Jesus. You see, I told us yesterday that testifying of the grace of Jesus is not a function of studying or or cramming two or three scriptures and come to say them with oratorial dexterity. It's not to go know one or two scriptures and then come to say it loud. It, it doesn't even have anything to do with the fact that you are the president of the fellowship. When we x-ray the qualities that Paul picked out in that scripture, you will realize that testifying to the grace of God first and foremost is a life. And you have to travel through a lot of dealing with God in order to come to a point where your life is aligned with the whispers of Zion. If your life is not consistent with God, you have no business testifying of His grace. Because the grace of God is the economy of God that makes it possible for you to stand before God without fear of condemnation. And until you are able to apprehend that grace and it becomes a reality in your life, you cannot testify of it. Because according to spirit economy, you cannot give what you do not have. John said a man can only give what is given to him from above. So the Bible talking about the life of Jesus. He said of all that he began to do and to teach. So Jesus could not bring teaching, doctrine or truth to anybody except as himself. His lifestyle had become a testimony of the things that he was going to teach. Jesus' doctrine was not a function of knowledge. It was a function of the expression of the workings of the Spirit of God on his inside. So when Jesus spoke about love, it was because domesticated in his vessel is the economy of love at work. So if he spoke about love, he had the power to transmit love. He said, for their sake, I sanctify myself so that they too might be sanctified. So sanctification from the vistas of heaven is not about teaching on the doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification was about living the life of sanctification. So that anybody that hears you will come under the ambience of your oppression. And as it comes under that atmosphere, what will happen is that that reality of sanctification will be superimposed on him. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, he said, For as much as we have loved you, we have not only taught you the gospel of Christ, he said we have imparted the very substance of our soul. So what you are not, you cannot transfer. What you are not, you cannot give. And in order to give us a very clear insight as to the, the, the demands of this very emphasis I'm bringing, we made us understand that this business is a business of spirits. Everything you are doing is actually giving expression to the things you are trafficking from a pool of spirit beings. You may have a thought and you think your mind is working. If God helps you and you see on the other plane, you will discover that thing you call a thought was a, a whisperer. It was a being whispering into your senses. And what you are picking is actually what a spirit wants to give expression to. You find yourself lying at home. And then suddenly you felt like going on Facebook. You think it's because you like Facebook. What you don't know is that a spirit has already activated a meeting between you and somebody. So the time of that meeting has come. It just came to, to awaken you. And when you go there, you discover you, 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 you find a pretty damsel that has your time. And then all of a sudden you begin to gist. And then in that conversation you have a meeting in one week time. And then in one week time you are traveling to meet some, somebody somewhere. You did not know that all of those things, they had written that script in the spirit realm. The two of you are just playing it in time. That was why I took enormous time yesterday to show you how spiritual technologies are built. How cities are designed in the spirit realm. Because if you don't know, you may think your life is doing what you want to do. Well, I feel like doing this. Why would I not do it? Do it. Is it not my life? So you ask somebody, why are you behaving like this? He says, is it not my life? It's a sign that you, you don't have understanding. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you, to sift you like wheat. He said, but I have prayed. I have prayed for you that your faith faileth not. He said, when thou art recovered, strengthen thy brethren. 
you Peter never knew that his standing was not about him alone it was about every other person that was going to walk under the atmosphere of his anointing every other person that is supposed to be influenced by the scope of ordination their destiny dependent on his standing that was why i began to define what a place meant you know balaam thought it was about doing business with balak so he collected money to cost the children of israel when it was not going to work again they now advised balak he say these people they are god is in their midst you can't cost them but what you can do is that cause them to walk in iniquity if they walk in iniquity their god will begin to fight them now he did all of that because of appetite and greed for money Balaam never understood that in the prophetic ranking according to ordination he was one of the first prophets that will walk in the forensic dimension of prophecy and everybody that we ever experience that possibility of the prophetic is actually under the ambience of Balaam that is why today one of the greatest error of the prophetic is greed for money and it is lost for women the bible said it is an error of Balaam he grew from an error he said it is the way of Balaam he grew from the way of Balaam he became the doctrine of Balaam today they teach it in the prophetic say come on well if you fall you ask God for mercy all of us have our problems we have our challenges so just come on come on you are a man it is now a doctrine so the prophet comes and says bring a seed how much do you have I don't have money. And he said, No, no, no. This altar, when you would sow seed, the altar will begin to speak. It is the way of Balaam. If Balaam knew that what he was going to do will affect many generations of prophets, he would have rejected that money. But he had no understanding. So when Paul began to talk about bringing testimony to the grace of God, the first thing Paul was outlining was the demons that he went through, what his life was subjected to before he could come to a point where he would be a witness. He had to die many times to his ambitions. He had to die many times to his desires. Because what you don't know is that God has a standard. And if you don't meet that standard, you cannot stand as a mouthpiece of God. You may be talking on earth, making noise. But when we check, you may not be striking a chord in the realms of God. Men that speak and have the backings of heaven, they are the only people that earth will number as men. Did you notice that in heaven, in the days of Paul, the church was represented in heaven as a candlestick. And Jesus said, if the church fail, he will remove the candlestick from the lampstand. So you can sit on earth and say, we are church, we are church. You are singing every Sunday and you are 10,000. But in heaven, your candle has been removed. So that territory is full of darkness because there is no light. Did you not read in the Bible? The Bible said, in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile, he said the people that sat in darkness there were Pharisees there they were preaching the gospel in fact they respected them so much they were the doctors of the law they had insight as to the ways of God if the Pharisees look at you and say Kai this man is accurate the whole community will accept you as a man of God it doesn't matter what you are doing the way NUC accredits university that's what the Pharisees were so when John began his baptismal service they came and said who are you if we don't validate you, what you are doing is not ministry space. Meanwhile, the very territory where they dwell, the Bible said it was covered with darkness. Because they were talking on earth, but in heaven there was no lampstand. So everything they were doing on earth could not strike a chord in eternity. That is how the lives of many of us are. Yes, you may be head of the worship team, and then because you have a good voice, you come up and oh wow people will say Kai, this sister this sister and then they are feeling some goosebumps when you feel goosebumps it doesn't mean god is touching you man is a component a trapatite component he has emotion in his soul if your emotional cord has struck you will feel it that's why when michael jackson shows up people fall under the anointing it's, it's the soul reaction it doesn't necessarily mean that god is something is happening the only way you will know that you are accurate with god is by the witness of the spirit and only men who are in sync with the standards of heaven can feel that movement on their inside. He said, knowing the seed of God, he said, he commanded men to depart from iniquity. Paul revealed to us that bringing testimony to God was a life before it was a doctrine. There are four things that are in that scripture. I don't have time to begin to do the exegesis. We will be lost because we don't have time. But there are four things I want to show you quickly from that scripture. Those four things are part of the 24 things that the Bible reveals to be the things that makes the immortals to rejoice. You see, it's not too many things that make spirits to rejoice. 
you may buy a car today and say, hey, oh, 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 we have bought a car, we have bought a car. You come to church, we are doing Thanksgiving. You dance here and there, and you say, car doesn't move spirits. Because the realm of their dwelling, they don't travel with vehicles. They travel with wear wings. You may go to travel in a plane, and the first time you flew in a plane, you took selfie like this, because you want all your friends on Facebook to know that you are in the plane. That economy doesn't move spirits. They are not moved by physical things. If you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, in my own study, there could be more, because there are scholars, there are theologians who are scholars. But me, I found 24 things that made the mortars to rejoice. Four of them were in that scripture that Paul spoke about. And the first thing you will see in that scripture is a contrite heart and a broken spirit. <laughs> you know, our generation is a generation of revelation and rema. You come on Facebook and then you see somebody write. <laughs> we don't have the spirit of God. We are now the spirit of God because we are one with Christ. They won't stop there. Then they will begin to quote that Kenneth Hagin was wrong. Bishop Oedeku was wrong. <laughs> there's arrogance, there's pride. We think it's about knowledge. We don't know that your knowledge will not move spirit until you have support and backing from heaven. That's why your revelation as bogus as it is cannot be proven. Because before you can shift darkness, you must walk by the power of eternity. So many bogusness. When we preach and the power of God moves, then we, begin, we walk out of the state like this. The apostles to the nations have come. You walk like this. When people come to heal you, oh, God bless you. Oh. Pride. Meanwhile, what you don't know is that pride is an appetite that the spirit of this world are light on. You can be on the stage and then you begin to minister from the frequency of the spirit of this world. Did you notice that Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. He said, But my Father which is in heaven. At that time, he was connected to the frequency of heaven. But the next minute, he put Jesus to the side and began to rebuke him. And Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan. So you can be on the stage here. The moment you connect to the frequency of pride, what happens is that the spirit of the world has taken over you. Because the spirit of the world walk on three antennas. One of them is the lust of the eyes. One of them is the lust of the flesh. And the third one is the pride of life. Every time you begin to walk by pride, you have another spirit has taken over you. You have changed frequency, but you didn't know. You know, when you are listening to radio, you can change from 95.1. And then you tune to 93.4. There will still be broadcast. Broadcast is going on, but you are flowing from another frequency. The spirit of this age will take over you. Because there is no pride. Before you can serve God and receive his, his stamp, you must be a man of a broken spirit. The Bible said, a contrite heart and a broken spirit, the Lord cannot. The Lord cannot despise it. Did you notice? Ah! It is, the, it is the signature of Lucifer. Pride is the signature of Lucifer. Every time you engage in it, you remind heaven of the Luciferous rebellion. I told you about the, 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 the credentials of Lucifer when he was walking in heaven. There is no angel as bright as him. Ah, he was called the son of the morning. You need to study the scriptures to find out. Read about Lucifer. You will see the intelligence of the architectural masterpiece of God. It was in Lucifer that God displayed the highest intelligence of his creativity. The Bible said, Thou that sealest the sun. Lucifer was decorated with so much brilliance that if he shows up like this, the sun will go dim. He was brighter than the sun. You can't look at Lucifer and see the sun. The sun will vanish. He was brighter. Do you notice when you have candle in your room and suddenly they bring light? The candle becomes irrelevant. That's how Lucifer oppresses the sun. He was brilliant, more brilliant than the constellation. Meanwhile, did you notice that David, when he looked at the stars, he began to wonder. He said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Because he saw the stars. He didn't know that Lucifer was brighter than the stars put together. He said, thou that sealed the sun. The guy was a, a masterpiece. It was the reflection of the glory of God demonstrated to creativity. And it didn't stop there. Among the spirits in heaven, he was an archangel. The Bible said there are 24 chief princes in heaven. Among the 24 chief princes, Lucifer was the only one the Bible recorded to be an anointed cherub. The meaning of the anointing means God is snared on you. 
You know the Bible said concerning the angels. He said, which of them at any time did I say, thou art my son? This day have I begotten you. That means the angels were not born of God. So they did not have the spirit of God as their operating system. They were designed to walk and serve the will of God. But they did not carry the DNA of God in their being. Only Lucifer did the Bible record that he was smeared with the spirit of God. He called him the anointed cherub. On the strength of that anointing, Lucifer could discern the move of God. Hope you know now, if you have grown in spiritual things, you will know when God is happy. That one, we call it the technology of the inner life. You will know when God is grieved. You will know when God wants you to move. It's a, it's a witness in your spirit. That thing is possible because you have the Holy Ghost. Lucifer had that capacity among the angelic. Other angels, they don't know. They just stand. Then God says, move. They move. All they do is that they are high commissioners of heaven that execute the mandate of Zion. But Lucifer has the ability to determine, to discern the movement in the heart of God. He knew when God was happy. Because he was the anointed cherub that covered it. If you study the scriptures, you discover that the seraphims were the ones that walk in the coals of fire. Then the cherubims are the ones that guide the glory of God. Did you notice that when the mercy seat was built, two cherubims, they covered the glory. That's the job description of cherubims. They guide the glory of God. When Adam fell in the garden of Eden and God wanted to protect his glory, it was a cherub that he sent there with a, swing, a flaming sword. Lucifer functioned as a cherub. He also functioned as a seraphim. The Bible said he walked in the midst of the coals of fire. When Isaiah had the revelation of God, he saw the seraphims moving in the coals of fire. And one of them carried the coal and touched the stone. That's the job of the seraphims. They are called the burning ones. The cherubims are the ones that preserve and guard the glory of God. Lucifer functioned as a seraphim and as a cherubim. And they didn't stop there. Among the angels, God decided, after he created him as a spirit being, he now covered him with ten precious stones. The reason God covered him with ten precious stones was because in the angelic earth, the first earth, you know everything you read in Genesis chapter 1 is not creation. It's actually recreation. The only account of creation in Genesis chapter 1 is in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. From verse 2, what God came to do was to recreate. That's why you don't know how the water was created. You don't know how sand was created. You don't know how light was created. You don't know how darkness was created. He just called the light out of darkness. What he did in Genesis 1 was recreation. But, he decided to clothe Lucifer with stones so that Lucifer can operate on the earth. Lucifer was the angel that was the governor over the earth realm. If you study Isaiah 14 verse 12, the Bible called him, he said, Thou that weakest the earth, you shook the princes of the earth. It's from the earth, he said, that we are sent to heaven. He was on the earth, ruling over the affairs of the earth realm. So Lucifer was a principality that had the territory to his domain. All the other ranking angels, they stand in the presence of God. But God wielded one portion of the physical universe to Lucifer. And he didn't stop there. The Bible said, in the day of thy creation, thy types and thy tablets were in thee. He was in charge of worship, the governor of worship in heaven. It was Lucifer that determined the atmosphere of heaven. If, Lucifer, if God wants quietness in heaven, Lucifer knows what to do for heaven to go quiet. He controlled the, the frequency of heaven. If God wanted people, angels, to sing and worship, Lucifer knew what to do. There was no angel like him. The Bible said, the merchandise of beauty and wisdom were in him. He depicted the highest form of wisdom and beauty. And on the strength of his ordination, on the strength of his rank in the angelic, on the strength of the grace of God that was at work in his life, his heart was lifted in vanity. And the Bible said, Oh, thou Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou for thee? It shows you that you can be everything in God, but the day your heart is lifted in vanity, that is the day you are dethroned. The secret of dethronement in heaven is pride. So if there is anything the immortals hate, is to see a proud man. The Bible says God hates a proud look. You have not said anything, but because you are acting proud, God hates it. It reminds him of the waste of resources in Lucifer. It was in Lucifer that God decked the most resources of Zion. 
the anointing was invested on him wisdom was invested on him beauty was invested on him glory was invested on him that was why God lamented he said oh Lucifer oh oh it was an exclamation what a waste you may be here with gifts God have granted you gift you walk under an open heaven if you lift your voice the church the atmosphere open and then the devil wants to destroy you and then he comes to whisper to you that you are more special than everybody in the choir <laughs> the devil wants to dethrone you my brother you are not more special you are only given opportunity to walk at that time hope you saw the beautiful rendition that they carried out here when the lady and the guy were talking I was like now wow if you told me to do that thing in three weeks I may not be able to cram it I don't know whether they crammed it or they were talking by inspiration but that was excellent that was, that was awesome but it's possible that after they did a perfect rendition and they were going down they now felt like everybody in this church is looking at them and then the way they walked up will not be the way they will walk down you know <laughs> something has happened there is a distortion in alignment when they were coming up they were trusting God for mercy please Lord let's be able to do this thing the way we practice now that they have done it they forgot that it was the economy of mercy that brought them up so as they were leaving the change what they don't know is that they have despised God because what carried them up to perform was an economy of God called mercy now that they are going down they don't need the mercy of God anymore because part of Lucifer's operating system is independence from God so you came up by God to serve but when you were going down you told God I don't need you anymore you thought it was a show but you don't know that your thought is an utterance in the spirit your thought what you think here that is not seen in the realm of the spirit is a notable utterance it will appear like a dark cloud that was why I say you thought in your heart the guy had not spoken he only thought in his heart and he was judged because in heaven your thoughts are also utterances there are many things in time that you think don't matter for example blood I told you yesterday how that blood speaks in the courts of heaven you may spill a blood and then you don't what is this it's blood now the guy don't die waiting happen meanwhile the bible says under the throne of god all the martyrs he said they are crying for vengeance their mouth was not the one talking it was their blood that was speaking the same way your pride speaks in heaven it speaks and it, it brings reproach to the name of god but when you want the spirits to love you the bible said you must be of a contrite heart you must be a, a, an entity that depicts humility because humility is one of the cardinal demands of service. He said, who shall ascend to the mountains of God? Who shall stand upon his holy hill? He said, him that is of a pure heart, who have not lifted off his heart in vanity. God will do everything to break your pride. That one, he can't take it. If God will use you, it will take many years. I had made up my mind to, to serve God in 2006. It was in 2019 that God began to announce me. It took 13 years for my pride to break. Somebody else may take 20 years. I'm not betting they take 3 years. But for me, it took 13 years. And God is still working on it. Because it's only a fragment of it he has been able to deal with. And the degree to which God breaks you is the degree to which he will use you. Did you not notice that Jacob was the custodian of the Abrahamic blessing? It was not in doubt. He was the only seed of Abraham that could carry the blessing. Because it was committed to him by Isaac. But God couldn't use him. He was a proud man. The angel of God had to wrestle him from night until morning. And when it was possible, it was impossible to break his pride. The angel had to touch his thigh and broke him. The day he was broken, the Bible said when he was blessing his children, he stood on the staff. His confidence had been taken away. And when he was now leaning on the staff, the Bible said, As a prince, thou hast wrestled with God and man and prevailed. The day he became a prince in heaven was the day God succeeded in breaking him. If he was not broken, there is no way he would have been a prince. Authority would have been far from the boundaries of his habitation. When the guy was talking to his children, he was not prophesying. He was using his words to mold their destiny. He said, you Reuben, you are the first of my loins. You are a symbol of strength and wisdom, but as unstable as water, thou shalt not prosper. It was not prophecy. According to his ordination from heaven, he was designed to be a prosperous person. But this guy is a prince with God. So he said, I change it in time. You will not prosper. You are the first. You are supposed to be a sign of power. He said, but me as a prince with God, I change it. 
That is a broken man talking. When a broken man speaks, heaven backs him up. You want to know the secret of authority? It's brokenness. Some of you have been praying. You do 21 days fasting and prayer. And when you come out, you, just, you are telling everybody, uh, yesterday we just cancelled 21 days. What you have done is that, what you trap from heaven, you have diffused it with one statement. <laughs> That's why I said, do this business in secret. For your own safety, do it in secret. Your heavenly father that sees in secret, we bless you in the public. Amen, oh boy. This year, never trouble. Every morning, now just six o'clock, we take some light meal. You know, we, the nations, the nations are calling. The na- you will wait until you start seeing gray hair on your. <laughs> you rain, you rain, Shenza, your skin. Kadosh, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh. Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. So, the Bible said, He was head and shoulder above everybody in Israel. But the way Saul looked at himself was small. And on the strength of who he saw himself, God decided to make him king. When he became king, he now got him that God will come. I'm bigger than everybody here now. You and Samuel said, God is speaking. He said, When you were small in your own eyes, did I not make you king over Israel? What have you done? You thought you were small and God came to magnify you. Now you think you are bigger. Oh, and instead of Saul to break down and cry, Samuel turned to go and he held him and pulled his clothes and he tore his garment. And he said, look, the Lord has turned the kingdom out of thy hands. What he did in the flesh, I told you, the intelligence of priesthood is to be able to interpret physical things from their heavenly significances. Ah! He said, you have turned your kingdom. You have turned your kingdom. He said, look, your kingdom, that night, him and his son were destroyed. When you were small, in your own eyes. Did I not make you king? Why do you now think you are big? Because you are the one that handles the, the mic every fellowship day. You don't know that those who are seated here, some of them are prophets. There are people here that will never handle this mic. But when they live here, after five years, you will hear their names in the nations of the world. Ah! Have you not read the stories of men? When they come back and tell you, I went to Ambrose Ali University. Then you say, you, which year did you graduate? You never knew them because in the fellowship that time God was dealing with them. They were dying to flesh. They were, you, you were on the microphone saying, Kapa, Kapo, Zete, Kapo, Marika. The guy was dying to flesh. After 10 years, you may be an usher in that church if you have mercy. <laughs> oh my God. If the mothers don't educate you, you will be wasting away fully and you will think you are doing so much. You will be wasting. You will think you are doing so much. When you were small. In your own eyes. In your own eyes. They said the Bible school Catherine Kuman went to. When she said that was where she finished from. Nobody recognized her. Even her maids didn't know she was there. Because in the class. You know when you are in the Bible college. If you ask a question. Who is God? You see 10 people. want to. They want to show that. Uh, you know we didn't come here ignorant. We came here because uh, we are following the instructions of God. We know the Bible. We they want to answer very quickly. There are some that will never talk. Even if you say they should talk, they will say, Sir, I don't know if I'm right, but you see humility coming out of their face. The humility that is infusing from them, it speaks louder than their answers. That's why I say we are called to, to dispense the savour of His grace. Most times what you are not saying is louder than what you are shouting, trying to say. A contrite heart and a broken spirit. Is one of the things that makes the immortals to rejoice. A man who is broken is a proof that mortality can host glory. You know, this mortality cannot manage glory. But on the economy of mercy and grace, God decides to put the Holy Ghost in you. You are an experiment of heaven. To show that it is possible on the economy of grace for a, a broken man, a man of corruption, to be able to trap and to keep the glory. So you prove God right that his equation was correct. Hallelujah. 
Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. Unless you know these things and you walk by them. John ascended to the heights of the heavens. And he was carried into the throne room. The throne room is not a place where every being in heaven can enter. From scriptures we found out that there are only three sets of beings that can walk in the throne room. One of them are the archangels. They are the angels of the presence. You remember Gabriel when he was speaking to Zachariah. He said, I am Gabriel. That standed in the presence of God. And the angels that stand in the presence of God are the angels that, that guide children. You know, this baby doesn't, she can't exercise feet. As she is now, if God doesn't provide a robust covering for her, she demons will finish her. Did you notice when Jesus was a child, he was the son of God. But uh, it was the ministry of angels that saved his life. He said, take the child now and go to Egypt. So angels of the presence, they are the angels that operate the highest authority in heaven. They are the ones that guide children. They are one of the entities inside that stand in the presence. The second beings that stand in the presence are the four beasts. That have the face of a cow, a calf, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, and the face of a man. Their duty there is to worship God from morning to night. The Bible says day and night they don't see it, they worship. And then you have the 24 elders that sit on 24 thrones. When John entered heaven, he collided with the a strong angel in heaven, and the angel didn't know what was happening. You know, there are breaking news in heaven too. And it depends on your height in Zion. You can't pick certain things. The angel said to John, he said, <laughs> the, the summary of what he told John was that there's no hope for humanity. Because when John went to heaven, they began to show him first the things that were happening before God began to create man. You know, the Bible said Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. They were showing John some things that will happen before the beginning of time. Say, man was going to fall, but there's no hope for man. You see, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice in Revelation chapter 5. He said, who will go for us? And the guy said, there was none, both in heaven and on earth, or the world with it, that is able to open the scroll. And John began to cry. Yes, it's possible to cry in heaven. I will show you that one before I round up. That it's possible to cry in heaven. Some of you that are living your life anyhow say, we are born again. We are born again. You will cry in heaven. Yes, I will show you. I pray the Holy Ghost reminds me. It's possible to cry in heaven. And John wept. He said, he wept much. And one of the elders, the one that stands in the presence, he showed up. He said, weep not. He said, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, he has prevailed. That, that man, you know what was happening? It was breaking, breaking news. That was what was coming from the throne. And because of his proximity to God, he was able to apprehend it and bring to John. But you need to know that why they are operating where they are operating is because they were they are beings of worship. The Bible said, day and night, they fell from their throne. The throne is the symbol of their rank in heaven. He said they cast their crown. The crown is the signature of their authority. So before they begin to worship God, you know what they do? They remove everything that made them relevant. Relevant. You may say I'm the president of the fellowship. So you are. If you sit as president, you can't worship. Because you don't know what worship is. Worship is an utterance of a broken spirit. So if you don't have a broken spirit, if you like sing and cry, uh, you are just playing. Do you know the first time the word worship was used in the Bible? It was in Genesis 22 verse 5. There was no song there. It was Abraham surrendering his own child to God because God actually. You dethrone everything that makes you relevant because you have come to realize that there is a difference between creator and creation. So what you are doing is that creation is bowing before creator. 
So everything that makes you feel you are important, you surrender it. Because you have come to estimate willingly that you are nothing compared to him who is called the I am. That I am. Worship and all trance of a broken spirit. So they fell on their faces. They casted their crown. And they made a statement. They said, all things were created for thy pleasure. That means the reason God began to create is not because he has need. You know, when Lucifer was serving in heaven, he thought it was important. Hey, come on, heaven depends on me. What he didn't know is that the reason he was shining was because there's no war in heaven. You know, the dimensions of Michael cannot be relevant unless there's war. If you look at Michael in the spirit, he is like an armor tank. <laughs> oh my God. If the Bible had described who Michael was, you know, they were just in heaven watching. So Lucifer, because he was the one, worship was what they needed. They felt it was important. That's because he didn't know who Michael was. Because in the whole Bible, Michael is the only one the Bible called the archangel. The arch. That means among other ranking angels, he's first. He is the arch. He didn't know Michael. Because there was no need for warfare. The day he fell, Michael showed up like this. It was not God that pursued him from heaven. No. It was Michael. <laughs> You will think you are important until you fail. You are coming for the fellowship. Everybody say, Sir, Sir, welcome, welcome, welcome. And then you say, God bless you. The day you fall, then you come for the fellowship. And then you, you pass. Uh, uh, well done. Ah, is it me they are greeting like that? Uh-huh. Now, who, who before? Who you be? Ah, is it me they are talking to like this? Yes, it's you. You have nothing. It's glory that covered you. Now you have lost it. Michael suddenly showed up and he chased him. The Bible said there was no place for him anymore. You don't know Gabriel. When Daniel saw Gabriel in his glory, he fell down and died. Do you, do you know everybody that saw God in the Bible, they fell down like dead men. Ezekiel said in the 30th month on the 5th day, I was among the captives by the river Kappa and I saw visions of God. He's... <laughs> Before he saw God, he began to describe his entourage. He took 24 chapters to describe verses to describe the entourage that came with God. Meanwhile, when he was seeing this thing, he fell down. He was like a dead man. It was when God spoke that the word entered into him and carried him up. You can't see God and stand. Isaiah saw him. He said in the year that King Josiah died, I saw the Lord. I if you see glory, your life will change. You, are, you know the reason you are struggling is because for you Christianity is a set of rules. Christianity for you is not different from Islam. You just have rules you must obey. You must wake up in the morning and pray. You must wake up. I pray that the Lord open your eyes to passive glory. If you see glory, what happens is that you begin to be transformed. He says, as we behold him, we are changed. We are transformed. That's when a charlatan can become a veteran. 400 broken men came to to, 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 to David in the, in, the, in the cave of Adullam. They were broken, battered men that had no future. David carried them through the protocol of life. And when they saw glory, the Bible called them the mighty, the mighty men of David. When they wanted to build the sanctuary, what those men gave put together in our day today is what? $22 billion. David alone gave what was what? $5 billion. Those men who were in debt broken men, charlatans. They became mighty men. And when the Bible was giving their citation, it says, an s knight. Hey, Adoni the s knight. Adoni the s knight, who is also the Tacomite. He said, at one point, he lifted his spear and he slew 800 men. That was a broken man. He had become a warrior that can resonate the hand of heaven. He said, Shammah, the son of Hakeem. He said the armies of Israel ran from the land. He stood alone. One man defeated the garrison of armies. Ah! What does God do to man? You see, Eliezer, the son of Dodo. The guy fought until his hand was cleaved to the spear. They couldn't straighten the hand. This is a, he fought for morning to night. These were broken men. What happened? They saw glory. They saw glory. And they were changed. Everybody that sees the glory is transformed. But the point I'm making is, 
Only God had that status that if you see him in the spirit, you will fail. Fall down like a dead man. When Daniel saw Gabriel, he fell like a dead man. That was the glory that Gabriel carried. But Lucifer did not know. He thought he was the only relevant person. Meanwhile, you need to know that the Bible said there are 24 chief princes in heaven. In the whole scripture, only three were mentioned. Lucifer, Michael, and Gabriel. We don't even know the other ones. Maybe you can't describe them. You know, the Bible said there are some men that the word is not worthy for their names to be mentioned. Maybe when you get to heaven and you have the opportunity to see them, did you read in Revelation that the Bible said the two witnesses, they will stand on the earth, their head will be touching the clouds of heaven. One of their legs is in all the sea. One is in all the land. That's an angel, one angel. And then when you begin to contemplate these possibilities, then you try to imagine who is the one that sits on the throne? The monarch of Zion. The monarch. The monarch. That's when it will not be difficult for you to kneel down and worship. Even if you are wearing a white suit. You will lie down in the dust. Because he's the one that lifted up the beggar from the donkey. And make it to stand among princes. You don't have any credentials to stand there. But when the mighty hand of God comes. He can deliver people from 430 years of captivity. He judged the cause of Egypt. The monarch of Zion. When you know him, the only thing you will want to do is to worship. Worship is not a song. Yes, we can worship with a song, but it's too bad than a song. It is a substance of glory, a meeting from the life of a man. Because he has seen the eternal excellency of the monarch of Zion. What are the things that make the mortals to rejoice? One on the top list is the act of worship. It will challenge your life. It will challenge your stand. You may be in class. Everybody is cheating. Or you are the scholar of the class. And your best friend is in that class. And when the exam came, you are writing your final paper. And then the lady, she said, look at my script. It's a many 10 minutes to go. I've not, write, I've not written anything. You want me to have a star here? Then it's begging like this. If you are not careful, uncircumcised compassion can make you to give up God and help the person. But when you know what worship is, that friendship can be lost so that God can be glorified. That's where worship becomes deeper than song. Your children are dying and then you saw somebody kept money. The easiest thing to do is to carry it and apologize later and even pay. But because your heart is circumcised, it will be better for them to die. You have not seen anything. The Bible you are reading, you don't know how it got to you. The Bible came to this generation because they were worshippers. Some of them, they tied them to stakes. They saw their families burnt. To bring the only copy of the Bible in the world. But they refused. Their families were burnt in their eyes. They stood, they watched them. But they were never. The Bible spoke of people that brought worship to God in church history rather. Women like Felicity. She was pregnant. They told her to reject Jesus. She refused they kept her, waited until she gave birth because according to the Roman law, somebody is not guilty unless he or she is tried. So the baby in the womb is not guilty. After she gave birth, two days later, her and her servant, they carried them to the arena, stripped them naked. You may be thinking, okay, because of my baby, let me just reject Jesus. At least my baby is innocent. She needs to know God. We don't know what men did for Christianity to get to you. It was white beasts they launched at them and they tore them apart. They were torn apart. Sacrifices. They tied men like John Hoos to the stake. And the guy laughed. He said, Today, his name Hoos means a geese. A goose, rather. Pluralized geese. He said, Today, this goose that you are born in, 100 years later, he will come as a swarm of geese. Statement he made, his spirit rose like an incense to heaven. It was 100 years later that Martin Luther came and challenged the Pope of Rome. Because a man stood, his wars became an incense in Zion. Today, you wouldn't have known the Bible because only priests read the Bible. When they read it in Latin, they'll tell you what you should do. When they were building the St. Peter's Basilica, they say if you give an offering, when your offering land inside the offering basket, your family member that is in limbo will go to heaven. Those were the things you would have believed. A whole generation would have been lost to error. But men of worship 
they stood and they imprinted their feet in the sands of eternity forever. Such men, they can never be forgotten. The Bible calls them overcomers. Jesus said, they that shall overcome, I will make them to be planted as trees of life in the house of my father. He said, I will give them a new name that no man knew it. For eternity, your name will be a memorial in heaven. Even on earth, there are certain men that the kind of sacrifice they gave, he made the whole generation to be wielded to them. Everybody that lived in the day of John have no reference apart from John. The Bible said until the time of John. So if you live in the generation of John, the only way they can find you in eternity is to trace you to John. Salt was his stature because of sacrifice. What are the things that make the mortars rejoice? Those are the things that define the economy of life. If your life has not begun to make them rejoice, you are not living, you are not alive. I read a story that I will never forget. I wish I told it every day of my life. My Smoro went to a tomb. And when he looked at the people that had died, 1974, 1975, and then he was wondering, he said, Lord, who are these people? And the Holy Ghost told him, these people never lived. They didn't live in time. They only had bread on their nostrils, but they didn't live. He said, why? But this, these are their tombs. He said, they didn't live because they never found their purpose. And they never did what God sent them into the world to do. What will rob you from finding your purpose is not because the voice of God is cast, it's your appetite. And your appetite is one thing you sacrifice on the altar of worship. If you live for your appetite, you will never hear the whispers of Zion. What are the things that made the mortars to rejoice? The third one I will tell you this morning is called obedience. Someone came to Saul. He said, Is God so pleased with sacrifice? You think it's about what you can do for God. You know some of these big guys, they come to church, they say the church wants to build. They say, how much is the budget? They say, 100, 100 a million. They say, okay, don't worry. When the people give their offering, whatever is remaining, we will top it up. And because they gave like that, when they come to church, they want them to be honored. Let them sit in front and let everybody every day be hitting them. That's not how the economy of heaven works. That one you are doing is your part. You are playing. Because God gave you substance to advance the kingdom. Somebody else is part is intercession. The way you give 50 million, somebody else, what he's giving are prayer thanks. Prayer thanks to heaven. So that by the powers of intercession, he can move the hand of God in the territory. So that people see your own does not mean you are more relevant than the ones that are not seen. Your own is seen, but the intercessory one, they rise to heaven as incense. Men receive your offering on earth, but in heaven, it is the archangels that receive prayer incense. The Bible said they mingle it with sweet calamus so that it will have touch with God. So don't think because you gave something you are relevant. Obedience to the voice of God. What God tells you to do, that is where your life will be navigating. The direction of your life is the direction of the word of the Lord. And if you are not obedient for, for it, to it rather, you will not be living even though you are breathing. Did you read about Jesus? He came to John's Baptist Masters for God's sake. This man is called the creator of all things. The Bible said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He said the same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him and there was nothing that was made but by him. He created man and everything. In Colossians 1.16 the Bible said even the principalities and powers, the dominion, he said they were created. Everything in the visible and in the invisible realm. But here is a man. He came to John and then he went to be baptized by John. You know, some of you who are fellowship president, the power of God may be moving, and God say, Let the usher pray for everybody. And then, when the usher is praying, you will now come and stand at the back because he asked, Let people know that you know the usher is not praying for you, he's praying for the younger believers. You, you, you are a man of stature. <laughs> he went to John and he went to be baptized. And John said, No, 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 you know, religion, I, I should be baptized of you. I should. He said, No. He says, suffer it to be so for now. What it means is that this is not a doctrine. This is me obeying the present revelation position of the Spirit. Because according to doctrine, the Bible says, without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So I am not trying to defy doctrine. But now, this is what the demand of heaven places on me. Suffer it to be so for now. For thus it be comment of us to fulfill all righteousness. Obedience is the hardest thing you will do except flesh dies. 
Have you seen that time when your husband had a quarrel with somebody and then the Holy Ghost said, as you woke up in the morning, go and kill the man. What? I need to show him what he did was wrong. In fact, my husband is older than him. Why would he do what he did? He said, go and greet the man. Because God is not interested who is right or wrong. God is interested in souls. And two of them are on their way to hell. And what you want to do is the only thing that will save them. He said, go and greet the man. And then you struggle with that. Struggle, struggle, struggle. Then the next day he said, cook a good meal for the family. <laughs> hey, people don't know how to grow in God. You may fast and pray for many years. What you are trusting God for, you not see it. Because your fasting and prayer will not deal with your flesh. If God wants to begin to help you, He will begin to fight the flesh. The more the flesh dies, the more you see God glow out of you. He will glow out of you. He will glow out of you. And after Jesus obeyed and was baptized, the Bible said, He was led into the wilderness, not to be celebrated, to be tempted of the devil. And when he passed the test, the next thing we heard, he said he returned in the power of the Spirit. I know a lot of young people that pray for power. Say, Lord, power, power. Why? Because the people know they are apostles. They call them prophets. They call them apostles. And you know, there has to be power so that this thing will we match their status. So they keep praying. 21 days in tongues and prayer is power they are praying for. You will never see it. Because glory does not survive on flesh. If God wants to really give you the power, He will begin to change flesh. You people did something. And then when you came, they began to hear somebody. And they want to say, no, no, I'm the one that did it. And the Holy Ghost say, keep quiet. And then everybody hailed that guy, say, this is the guy that did it. That's why life, Christianity moves from doctrine to life. You may know all the doctrine, but you may not have life. The Holy Ghost wants to walk life into you. He begins to interact and engage you by himself. The Bible said in Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 down to 8. He said, let this mind be in you. The same that was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind cultivate this mindset. Tell yourself it's not about me, it's about God. Anything God wants, that is the way forward. And he said, who being in the form of God Consider it not robbery to be equal with man. What happened is that Jesus had to strip himself of the garment of divinity. Everything that made him the omniscient one, the omniscient one, the omnipotent one, he removed it off. And he didn't stop there. He had to go through the humiliation of becoming a man. Can you imagine if God say, uh, there's crisis now in the ant kingdom, so we have to make you an ant. Or you have to be made a pig. I think a pig is a better... You know pigs, you, have, you too have to be sleeping in the mud now. And then you eat all kinds of things. Because you need to deliver the pig kingdom. The man that all he knew was glory and worship. He stripped himself of divinity. He wore the suitcase of man. And he didn't stop there. He became a servant. And as a servant, he suffered. He suffered obedience. He had to obey. He suffered. And he learned to be there and through the things he suffered. And he didn't stop there. He was accused and he was killed. God, now knowing what it means, what death means. And he didn't stop there. He said he died the death of a criminal. That's the mindset he says you have. You come to a place you feel you should be honored and everybody is holding you. Get out from here. Ah! Or you come for a meeting. And then you felt they knew you were the guest minister. And as you came, then I said, No, 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 can't, can't go to the back, go to the back, no space in the church again. And everybody turned and looked at you. And meanwhile, you were coming comforted. And then when you went to the back, they now discovered, Okay, you are the guest minister. All right, come. They didn't even do anything to apologize to you. And then your message that day scatters. That is because that mind is not in you. Apostle went for a meeting. You know, students can be very, 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 very arrogant. He went for a meeting. They told the administration at 7 30. And by 7.30, they didn't come. 8, they didn't come. So he started strolling to the meeting. <laughs> he was strolling. And they met him on the road. Sorry, sir. You know what they do now? <laughs> he said, no, no. Allah. Let's go and feed. And that day, he said, the kind of power he saw. Himself was shocked. Because why? Let this mind be in you. 
that thing that is telling you you are better than another person is a serpent. It's the serpentine nature that is speaking to you. That is telling you that you should be honored above other people is a serpent. That's what he felt. He said, I will lift up my throne to heaven. I will rise above the stars of God. I will sit above the might of the congregation. In the sights of the north, I will be like the most high. He thought he was more important than all the angels. The only person he could equate himself to was God. And the reason he equated himself with God because there is no height higher than God in heaven. If there was, he would have to choose that one. It's the nature of the devil. Your life can never make God happy, no matter what you do. The things that make the mortars to rejoice. They are not too many, my brother. But if you find them and you pattern your life after it, God will begin to invest glory in your life. Let me round up. We don't have time. I wanted to give you five. But I need to pray for the sick. I will round up on this note and give you some highlights. Because there are many young people here. I will give you some highlights about myself. Not as a sign of pride, but to show you that what is happening to you is the same thing God is doing to you and the other person. The Bible says no sin is peculiar to you. What you are going through is what every other person is going through. At the age of seven, I saw an open vision and I saw the Lord seated on the throne. And I saw a lot of things that happened and the things I heard, which I may not be able to tell you. And from that day, I knew I was called of God. From that day, I began to have open visions. Open, I will see a screen appear and I will see things happening. And the next day as I go out, the same thing will be playing out. The point came as I began to grow. And I thought I was a special child. And my mom didn't make it easy. Sometimes when they do something in the house, and me too, I do. He will say, ah, you do? Ah, you don't know God wants to use you. You do? Oh, I was not well discipled. So I now felt, okay, me too. That means there's something special. I began to feel very important. And God wanted to help the young boy. It was in 2006 I made up my mind that I would serve the Lord. And when God wanted to help me, God now began to expose me to very stringent syllabus that will break what doctrine could not correct. You know the problem of revelation is that the more you know it, the more you become high-minded. So when we know more about God, we become lofty. We want to tell everybody. So sometimes I was exposed to embarrassment and I was innocent. And I will not be given the opportunity to explain. And I will pray for intervention. Nothing will happen. What? The thing was so difficult that it was as if I was going to die. First, it began with my father. I'm tell- what I'm telling you, at the age of nine, I went to my father. I heard, I heard a, a voice spoke to me from the wall. He said, tell him, if you are not careful, you will be the architect of your misfortune. I didn't know what architect me. I went and told him, I said, daddy. If you are not careful, God said you will be the architect of your misfortune. I began to give prophetic word at night. I thought I was, there was something about me. And God began to break, break me. I said I would serve God in 2006. It was in December last year God began to speak to me about service. I was going for meetings representing Apostle Arome. You go on Facebook, put it, nobody knows you are there. Like Apostle will say, if you like, go to TV and say, I am here! That day nobody will tune in. Is the intelligence of the divine. A point came. Even my own friends, God began to use them to deal with me. A friend of mine who were pastors together in Remnant. He has a fellowship in BSU. It's the largest fellowship in BSU. And then at that time, God asked me to go and work with him. So when I went there, I said, that was in 2017. As at that time, I already had a master's degree. And God sent me to a fellowship that was on campus. Say, go and work with him. I had already applied for my doctorate degree. And when I came to my friend, my friend said, okay, uh, come, let me tell you the department you're working. And he carried me to the ushering you department. <laughs> and he said, you will grow through the ladder. I, I know what it means to fast and pray for the whole year. At the time I'm talking to you now. I want to let you know it's not about the much fasting and prayer. You can go to the mountain. At this time, I'm telling you, right? I had received impartation from men like Reverend Chris Wakilomi. I had received impartation from men like Dr. Paul Enenche. At this time, 
He said, go. I thought the anointing, what okay, the anointing is to receive from somebody and manifest. I will go for meetings in Lagos. Men like Sadhu Savaraj I attended their conferences. Apostle Arobe had already prophesied to me about the nations. My friend said, come and be usher. I will come to church, then they will put me at the door because I was the, the earliest usher. The senior usher usually sit down and give instruction. <laughs> so I, will, I will stand, then the brothers will come in, the sisters will come. He would have salute them with a smile and give them an envelope. When I did that thing for one year, six months, that was when my heart was healed. And I realized that man is nothing. Man is actually dust. What gives him glory is the God that is on his inside. That's why you are called human. It means humus man. You were created from humus. What gives you value is the God that is on your inside. And everything God carries you through has done nothing to the God on your inside. It is the flesh that will resist God that is breaking. In 2017, my brother died. I was teaching in the Bible school. And God, the next day I was supposed to do an impartation service. And God didn't change the calendar in heaven. Go and do the impartation service. And my brother died the day before. I came, I was talking to the people and I was crying. They felt it was the glory of God that was on me. <laughs> my brother died yesterday. His body is in the mortuary. And we are only two. And he's my elder brother. He's the one that taught me everything I knew. At the time he died, I was living with him. I didn't sleep in that house for seven months. And I didn't sleep there again until I packed. Because I couldn't sleep there. To tell you the level of closeness. He said, go and do the impartation service. I was crying when I was talking. I will hug people as I'm praying for them. I will be weeping. I didn't even know what I told them. But God was teaching me how to die. I died to my ambition. I applied for Nigerian Air Force in short service, 2013. And God, they sent my name to, to Abuja. And that was when David Mark was in power. They hijacked the name. I knew the guy who was the air commodore. He's the commandant of the tactical air command in Makodi. He sent my name personally to Abuja. They removed the name. When God finished dealing with me, that was when the window came for me to join the Nigerian Navy. But at that time, I had died. My ambitions had died. That time I had accepted to serve God whether he gives me money or not. Whether he gives me fame or not. And in, in December 2018, God told me, he said, there will be a temptation coming your way. He said, don't fall because I want to begin to announce you. It took 13 years. I want to begin to announce it. And on the 24th of February, four days to my birthday, which was 1st of March, the Lord told me, get Few, these your messages. I got the messages. And he said, cut these clips out of them and tag it, call it the Puritan capsules. So some were five minutes, some were six minutes, some were ten minutes. I cut it. And he asked me to release it on Telegram. And I dropped it on Telegram. On the 11th of February, which is around three of, of March, which is around three weeks, the Puritan capsule had gone to seven nations of the world. On the 13th of March, I received an invitation to preach in Tulsa, Oklahoma, United States of America. This was in less than four weeks. In less than four weeks. I received invitation from more than 18 states in this country. In less than four weeks. What people took years of labor to enter, I was never known on the landscape. He kept me at the back side of the wilderness and he was dealing with me because he knew that what was operational in me was pride. One of those days I was praying in my room and then the Lord opened my eyes. The walls vanished. And then my room moved to the center of my village and I saw two beings. One of them had ten horns. The other one was as if they exhumed the person from the grave. You could see through the bones. And he said, these are the two principalities that control the lives and the destinies of people in your family. There are four things they use to oppress people. He said, one of them is pride. The other one is loss and immorality. The other one is, is lying. And the other one is anger. He said, if you will not fall to any of these things, I will use it. I thought it was prayer and fasting that would deal with it. No. Sometimes it's public disgrace. Sometimes it's public humiliation. Sometimes it's public shame. The thing you are fighting so much to protect yourself from, that is the gate to greatness. 
One person accuses you, the Holy Ghost says, Calm down, let me defend you. But you must tell everybody. You call everybody and say, It's not me that did it. Oh, it's this person. As we are talking, you lose your peace. God say, Keep quiet. It's when you go through it that your life will begin to blow up. He said, When you walk through the waters, you will not be drowned. When you walk through the fire, you will not be born. Why? Because God is there. Even if the confederacy of darkness gather around you to destroy you, they can't. Because it says, speak a word, it shall not stand. Bring counsel together, it shall come to know. Because our God is in our midst. God is trying to walk himself into your life so that you can become an invincible entity. That is when you become what Jesus called a, like the wind blow it. No man know what, how it go it or where it come at. He says, so are they that are born. A man who is born of the Spirit is not just a man who is born again. It's a man who has gone through the dealings of God until his life becomes a theater through which the dimensions of heaven can be seen. Those are the things flesh will fight. And if God wants to do business with you, he will break you. Oh! How beautiful it is to behold a man that God has broken. When the Lord breaks a man, that's when the immortals begin to do business with men. You want to do business with God, you must come to the altar of sacrifice where you are broken. What are the things that makes the immortals to rejoice? I wish I had time. Doctrine will not help you. It will only teach you truth so that you can pattern your life after the ways of God. But if you must be relevant to your generation, God must break you. The Bible said concerning David, He said, after he has served his generation according to the will of the Lord, he rested with his fathers. Why was David like that? Because he was a broken man. It was David that the prophet accused and he went on his knees. David is a king, but in the public he can tear his cloth and begin to ask God for mercy. Because he knows he has no throne except as God placed him there. That's a broken man. Only such men can their voices be heard in Zion. The reason you speak and you say things happen on earth is because your voice can be heard in Zion. A man who cannot be heard from the heights of Zion, he cannot move anything in the landscape. Because demons, principalities and powers, they will challenge. You know, Jesus told Peter, he said, upon this revelation, I will build my church. This is the strategy by which you make things happen on earth. When you can pick it from the height of heaven, your intelligence cannot change anything. Your power cannot change anything. It's the degree to which God works in you that will make a difference in the lives of men. What do you think you will tell a prostitute that will change her? What do you think you will tell a thief that will change him? Nicodemus said, I have been old. The word old is not old age. I have been schooled by the flesh all my life. How do you expect me to accept a new philosophy? The guy steals to survive. And now he has learned to spread money like water. What will you tell him to put his arms away? The lady sleeps with different men every night. What are you going to tell her? Every time she needs money to make her head, the only thing that comes to her head is to sleep with a man. And you think you'll come and tell him, of God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten sorry. And whosoever believes, she'll be telling What has kept her in bondage is power. Is the power of darkness. I was preaching in Jesus' conference in Wukari. And seven days after the meeting, a lady called me. She had to wait for seven days. You know why? For the past seven, for the past two years, rather, she can't go three nights without sleeping with a man. If her boyfriends are not around, she'll go to her classmate, all this yao yao guy, and just pass the night there. She was a slave, a puppet in the hands of an immoral spirit. While the meeting was going on, somebody, a being stood up and walked out of her. That is not doctrine, it's called power. Power is not about people falling down. It's the capacity to make people's life conform with what God wrote concerning them before the foundations of the world. Power is to bring people back to the signature and the handwriting of ordinances concerning them. Jesus said in the volumes of the book, it is written of me, I come to do that way. A man who walks with power is a man that can make the lives of men conform with the will of God. Sometimes God will need to heal. Sometimes God will need to cast out devil, but by all means, let his life align to the ordinations of God concerning him. You want to worship God now? This is the time.
say something. If you start the anointing, we break it. The hand of God has been pursuing you about. It's as if you know that God is of, on your matter. On your matter. I want to strengthen your faith this morning. If you are in that category, run out quickly. Let me pray with you before we begin the miracle service. You want to make a decision for Jesus? I'm not talking necessarily about wanting to give your heart to Christ. You know you have been calling it God, but you are not fulfilling the dictates, the demands of ordination. You have been struggling with it. Your flesh has made you a slave. Come and make a public confession now so that you can find help. You can find help. You can find help. The embers of Zion, they are coming now. Ome la hababuas, que vida mantariada now. Oh, no, no. 
Listen. Listen. The Lord has heard you. The Lord has heard you. Now lift your hands toward him. Let the anointing that will make you walk into your destiny begin to rest. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's the anointing. The power of God is about to descend. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Touch now. Touch now. Touch, Lord. Touch. 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 Touch, Lord. Touch. Touch. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Touch. I shall send them. I don't want people to eat you. Touch, 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 blow like a mighty wind. 
of it. Do you know what will happen here? As we grow, we will come to a point where we will begin to speak to people in your houses. And listen, listen to me. As the atmosphere grows, we begin to crescendo. You know, yesterday I told you that we will hit a crescendo where earth and heaven will become one. You thought it was a joke. Until after the beating, you couldn't go home. We will hit a crescendo that you will begin to call people in your houses. They will tell you they have just been healed. I was in a meeting last week. I told them, God will heal people at home. They thought it was a joke. When we spoke the word, a guy came, his father was paralyzed for six years on one side. The man jumped up and began to walk. He was not in the meeting. The anointing travels. It's not bound by space. It's not bound. A woman that had growth on her shoulder, the daughter called her, the growth vanished. Check your body. This is the first layer. Check your body. You discovered there was pain. The pain was gone. When the world something was wrong, you can't feel it anymore. As we praise God, come out and share. Bro, hit me with the sound again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, this 
one, the power of God is too strong. Let her, we will hear her. Short, hey, 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 help her, help her, help her. We will hear her. What did God do for you, brother? I was having a ear problem on my left hand, but now I... Oh, you were the one that what the knowledge came from. You were having a problem on your left ear. Yeah. What was the challenge? Your ear, almost two days now, it has been telling me what I've been But well, your ear is settled. Your ear is settled. And you are looking like that. You are looking like that. Somebody give a lot of shout out. What did God do for you, brother? Praise the Lord. The Lord has... Do something good to me. Yes, let's hear it. I came to the I came to church today. I was not really happy. Okay. So it used to be like they used to force me to come to church. So when I came today, I was like, What is happening? When I heard you preaching, I was like, my mind was almost out of the church. Of like I want to know what you are trying. So what did God do to you? Do the for Lord you today? changed me. Like seriously, I want to. I have lived my life now. Oh, you are changed. Are you feel like serving yes, God? Yes, I feel like serving the Lord. Struggling with fever. Even yesterday, I was unable to co- to finish the fellowship. I went back to the hospital, but now I'm feeling healthy. You are fine. Give the Lord the glory. What did God do for him? Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Anytime I want to sleep, I will feel that I'm afraid, and now I'm strong. And when I come into the church, my hands are I can't even shake my hands, and now I can shake them well, well. Glory to God. What did God do for her? Since yesterday, I was really feeling body pain, but today I'm really, I can't even jump. Glory to Jesus. What did God do for her? I went to start the Lord with all of God, but because of the evil spirit, is using you used to have what? I'm serving the Lord with all of my heart and give God the glory. Glory to God. What did God do for her? Since I resumed, I was having this cough, and even when I was seated at the back, I had to go out and come back, but right now and the cough is gone. Yes, wow, and really also good. I had a, 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 an experience in the time past when I was sleeping. I would see something real entering me. So I was tested. They said I had hepatitis, something like that. But I can't feel everything is gone now. You felt Jesus Christ. What you felt entered into you. Yes. You feel it's gone now. I will sleep and I saw something real entering me. Okay, go and do a test tomorrow and let, let the leadership know. Yes, what? Hallelujah. Praise God. Ah, uh, Many times, always I think of what I did at back and that makes me not even attend many fellowships the way I've been attending back. Even presently now before the prayer, I was thinking of what I did and making me not to be, making me uncomfortable. So what did God did do for you yes, now? Yes, he delivered me from all this thinking of the bad. You had a deliverance. Yes, what did God do for you? Hallelujah. I'm very weak in my spirit. Past two weeks. I, 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 can't, I can't pray well. I feel weak. So I came here. The, we are praying. I saw the Holy Spirit inside my body. I feel, I can feel in tongue. Can you go ahead and speak in tongues in the last one minute? Rakabondo Peteparia, Rina Tabua, Lakizo Zalabanda, Rakirondo Paresto, Jedigo Parido Tagadias, Sataka Palindo Paradiasto. Listen, listen, listen. Most of you will go home and discovered you have been healed of blood-related diseases. Listen. Listen, listen. You don't know what I'm talking about. When it happens, you'll be shocked that you didn't believe when I was saying it. Because your response will show that you were shocked. That you didn't believe. Most of you will discover you've been healed of blood-related diseases. Blood-related diseases. I don't... 
See, there is something God wants to do. We have not been able to hit it. What, what happened to this brother? Some 10 years ago. Yes. If it, Up to I got, yes. I got a serious problem in my head. Serious, serious what? Serious problem in my head. And now, so when starting, okay, okay. starting the phrases, and I feel something in my body, and I say, yes, there is a power in the praise. Mm. And now, I was feeling strongly, and I believe that that sickness has gone. Wow. Glory to God. Stand to maximize your walk with the Lord. By the way, tonight or this evening, we are going to be having a healing service, and um, it will be an explosive one. I assure you. We will just do a little bit of Bible studies to prepare your heart for the evening, and then to teach you how to make the most of spiritual realities. 
as we sow what tonight by the message of God. So I want to show you a few things that will help your walk with God. It's um, the dynamics of information trafficking in the spirit. The dynamics of information trafficking in the spirit. You know, we took the first two sessions to deal with matters of consecration because you can never amount to anything in God unless your life is consecrated to God. The greatest sacrifice of living is the sacrifice of consecration. The sacrifice of consecration is superior to the sacrifice of prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is included in consecration. But consecration is the total devotion of your life to the Lord. And that is the only way to live in this realm. Because like I made us understand from the beginning, this realm is littered with many entities with different purposes, different intentions, and different possibilities. In the Garden of Eden, there were only two entities that were granted the legal right of operation. It was God and man. So at that point, Adam could afford to be careless. Because apart from himself and his wife, only God invaded the garden and interacted with them. So fellowship was fluid. Fellowship was flawless. Because man had an uncheckered access in his relationship with God. God could just stumble into the garden at any time. The Bible said, in the cool of the morning, in the cool of the day, the spirit, the voice of God came walking in the garden. So if Adam heard anything apart from Eve, he knew it was God. He had a clear cut relationship with God. The realm was sealed from the invasion and the interaction of other entities in the realm. It was sealed. But upon the fall, the seal upon the earth was broken. So God was not only the entity that could interact with man and exert his authority. Demons also had access to man. Angels also had access to man. Principalities and powers also had access to man. Rulers of the darkness of this world also had access to man and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. So, the only way man's security on earth could be guaranteed was by the protocol of consecration. If man wanted to stay intact and secure in fulfilling his purpose in the world, then he had to devote his life perpetually to God. In the garden, whether he liked it or not, his life was collected unto the Lord because God was the only one that had access. But right now, the realm is open. There are many spirits that could interact with him. So he had to make the effort through spiritual intelligence to consecrate himself to the Lord. And that was why we looked at the subject of priesthood. Because it's in priesthood that we are given the wisdom required to completely consecrate ourselves to the Lord. You saw why we were explaining and opening scriptures yesterday how that priesthood will first of all walk God into your heart and secure you from within so that you can become a man of the presence. I showed you yesterday how that the end of priesthood is to come into the Holy of Holies where you have direct contact with the presence of God. And from there, you can now legislate and litigate the purpose of God at the earth realm. So priesthood was that is that ark that carries us in consecration to God. And now that you have understood what it means to consecrate your life, and most of you have consecrated your life to the Lord, you need to understand the systems in the kingdom for trafficking information. Because if you don't know and master how these things work, your life and your work with God will be frustrated. There are lots of things you'll be asking God to do that are already done. You would not just know how to traffic it. And then you will labor in vain. The Bible said in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 15. He said the labor of the foolish. Wearied every one of them. Because they know not how to enter the city. So the problem is not whether the city is available. 
the problem is not whether one could enter the city the problem was the problem of wisdom and understanding the labor of the foolish weary at every one of them because they know not how the moment you know the house of the kingdom and you are willing to apply yourself then everything that you desire will be at your beck and call when you see people struggle in life is a function of a lack of understanding i want to show you this morning how informations are trafficked in the system in the realm and you need to understand that every possibility in this realm is predicated upon the revelation that you have if you get the revelation of a reality you literally walk into it the realm is so complex that it does not lend itself to a man who cannot access it if you want to walk in the healing of in healing anointing for example all you need is to lay hold on the revelation if you walk if you want to walk in the supernatural all you need to do is to lay hold on the revelation revelations are the most prized commodities in the realm and revelations don't lend themselves to carnal men the bible said we have not received the spirit that is of the world but the spirit that is of god that we may know the things that are freely given to us and he said the things of god they are foolishness to the natural mind and he said they cannot have it because they are spiritually designed so before you lay hold on the revelation it will first of all transform you that is why revelations are very complex commodities a lot cannot have it but because you have consecrated yourself and you have decided to yield to the lord it has become your natural heritage to walk in revelation hallelujah you know the bible said something he said to them that are without these things are hid he said but for you that is in the kingdom you have access to it so this morning i want to show somebody something that will deliver him or her from struggles in the kingdom hallelujah it's going to be a very short very short exposition very short exposition so that we have enough time for our evening service spiritual information trafficking i'm going to touch four basic entities and how they relate how they transact and how they communicate in this kingdom i'm going to talk about god the father god the son and god the holy spirit and then i'm going to talk about the angelic realm and i'm going to talk about the demonic realm and then i'll talk about man these are four entities god the angelic the demonic and man because you are on earth and the earth realm is open you cannot but interact with god you cannot but interact with the angelic you cannot but interact with the demonic it's a must whether you like it or not you know sometimes you think because you don't know it it doesn't affect you you are joking you may not be a scientist so you may not understand the laws of universal gravitation but it doesn't mean you are not influenced by gravity if you are not influenced by gravity you will float and you will go into space so whether you know it or not it doesn't matter you may not understand the laws of electricity but you use it every day so your ignorance does not exonerate you from the effect of these operations but your understanding will give you an advantage on how to wield it in your direction so this morning we are going to look at these factors very quickly and then we we will shut down and prepare for the evening yes informations originate from the father every reality has its root in the father the word father for example is the word fundus and fundus simply means foundation fundus also means the source fundus means the sustainer fundus also means the nourisher so when we speak about god as father we are talking about the source and the origin of all things so everything originates from the father you see that when the world was created the bible said in the beginning elohim he didn't bother introducing the elohim who will you introduce him to who was there he was the only one there so for one you can't introduce him who are you introducing him to because there was nothing he was the only one who existed all by himself so the bible said in the beginning 
Elohim. So he reveals God as the source and the origin of all things. And the word Elohim means um, almighty. There are two dimensions to that word. Almighty. It means having all the power and the authority. All the power. You know, eventually you are going to see that there are different powers at different levels and with different entities. But at this point, it reveals Elohim as the source of all power. And that was why it was the Elohim that demonstrated the highest feat of power in creation. It is because he sustains all power. That was why he was the one that created the world in the first place. So it's a revelation of him having the ability to bring every other thing out of himself. So God is revealed in scriptures as the source. It also means plurality in oneness. But we don't have time to explain that for now. Alright? Because that's not where we are going to. It is in Elohim that the foundation of the doctrine of the Trinity is found. Are we together now? Because the Elohim speaks of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And in that scripture, you, you see all of that. The Bible said, the Spirit of God hovered upon the waters. And God said, the word went forth. The Spirit hovered on the water. The Father spoke the word. So the Elohim is the revelation of the plurality in oneness. Are we together? The Elohim reveals that there are three persons in one. And the Elohim also reveals that that three persons in one sustains all the authority. And in that authority, everything was created. So the Father is the source of all things. That was why in the beginning, you have to begin with the Father. So every form of information, every form of power, every form of revelation comes from the Father. And then somebody is asking, why is there evil? The power is not what is evil. It is the usage and the personality in which the power is with that is evil. For example, if I give you a gun, if a criminal is carrying a gun, you know it's a dangerous weapon. But if a soldier is carrying a gun, it becomes a protective tool. Do you see that? So the father created all things, but it was not the father that perverted all things. And as we go further into the demonic, you will look at all of that. The father is the source of all things. Your life is a projection of the father. That should give somebody confidence. That means you are not a mere mortal. You are not an ordinary person. You emanate from the father. You are an offspring of God. You proceed from the father. So yourself is also a projection of the source called the Father. The Bible said in John chapter 1 verse 12, He said, as many as believe, to them He gave power to become the sons of God. And even before that time, it also made us to understand that all things were made by Him. The Father. If you understand that everything proceeds from the Father, then it will alter your orientation in life. When I teach, I try to make it a bit practical because sometimes you hear these things and they just add to your data bank of information and it will not profit you. If you know the Father is the source of all things, when you need, you have a need, the first person that will come to mind is who? The Father. Not your uncle who is the governor. If you know the Father is the source, you know the proof that you know a thing is your application of it. Most of us say, God the Father is our source. But when we have a need, is the last that comes to mind. It's when every alternative fails, we now come to God. And the unfortunate thing is that at that point, we are already in the state of anxiety. So even while you are asking, your mind is still hoping whether somebody will call. That your uncle you talked to yesterday, maybe a call may come in. You are looking. <laughs> you don't juggle your life around like that. Set your gaze on God perpetually. Yes, men may help you, but men are only channels. Men are not your source. God is your source. Everything proceeds from the Father. He created all things. All things came out of Him. Hallelujah. The Son is the administrator of everything the Father produces. The Son is also the substance of reality. 
the word of the Lord. If the Father produces life, the form in which we have that life is by the Son. If the Father produces power, the form in which we have that power is by the Son. So, the Son is the one that incarnates the possibilities that proceed from the Father. So, without the Son, you cannot interact with the Father. So, if you want to feel the love of God, for example, Jesus is the one you will touch. It's just like this microphone. You know, this microphone is a complex connection of wires with electric current. If you touch it, you will die. This microphone that I'm handling, the reason I'm able to handle this microphone is because of the covering. So, the covering is what makes the power in this microphone user-friendly. Your handset is a, co is a complex operation combination of circuitries, circuit systems. The reason you can use your handset is because it is packaged in a user-friendly format. You can't touch your handset because it will be a complex wires connected in very complex circuits. The reason you can touch it is because it is packaged. This bulb you are seeing is this is current. This thing you are seeing is electric current. The reason you are seeing the light is because of the packaging. If you touch it without the covering, it will electrocute you, you will die. So, the basis of our interaction with the Father is the Son. The Son is the one that makes the Father communicable. So, when God wants to touch you, it's the Son you touch. When God wants to relate with you, it's the Son you relate with. So, every time you relate with the Son, you are relating directly with the Father. The Son is the substance of reality. The Son is the one that makes the Father communicable and interactable. The Bible says God dwells in the midst of unapproachable light. So you cannot come before the Lord. You can never touch God. You can never come close to God. If you come close to Him, you are consumed. He said He dwells in the midst of the coals of fire. The only reason by which you can touch the fullness of God is because the Son can communicate. He is the full package of the Father. So Colossians 2 verse 9 said, It pleases the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in Him bodily. So any dimension of the Father you want to touch, it is captured in the Son. So when we relate with Jesus, we are relating with the Father. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 1, from verse 1 to 4. Let me read. So that somebody will read the Bible. It's like we've not been reading the Bible. <laughs> we've not been reading the Bible. First John chapter 1. Let me show you this. Sometimes, if you put the word of God in your spirit, it's more effective. When it comes out, it comes out like bullets. The ones that will flow out of you will be the remalized utterances. The Holy Ghost will be shooting them. <laughs> I've gotten so used to meditating on the Word of God, and most times it becomes a challenge to. But let's make it a Bible study this morning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the Word of Life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father you see something eternal life is actually a projection from the father he said that life was with the father that means for the father's life to be communicated he will now show you the means by which eternal life was communicated. Eternal life is the reality of the Father. It is the life of the Father. But the means by which eternal life is communicated is what he wants to show you. He said that life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. He said that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with who? The Father. But how do we have fellowship with the father he said it is with his son jesus christ so the eternal life which is the life of the father the only means by which you can interact with him is to apprehend the son that's why he said whoever has the son had life he said for this life is in the son 
And he also said, the son is eternal life. So, eternal life, which was first of all the reality of the father, is now communicable to men mortars through a package called the son. So, the son is the substance of reality. Everything the father is made up of can be communicated by the son. It's just like a virus. If a virus wants to be communicated, the host does not need to come and live in you. All he needs to do is to transfer the virus to you. If a mosquito wants you to become, wants to give you malaria, the mosquito doesn't need to come and live in you. All he needs to do is to transmit it into your body. If a bacteria gets, wants to affect you, it just transmits it. After a while, what makes that mosquito, the organic life of that mosquito, is transmitted into you and suddenly you start falling sick because you have made contact with malaria. The substance of reality is the sun. So without the existence of the sun, you may never know who the father is. The sun is the substance of reality. The sun is the proof of the existence of the father. Without the sun, there is no proof that God exists. You can never prove the existence of God without the sun. It's a system in God for trafficking information. It's the, our fellowship is with the Father, but we have never seen the Father. We have never made contact with the Father. The one we made contact with is the Son. But every time you touch the Son, you touch the Father. Philip came to Jesus and asked him, he said, show us the Father that we may know him. And he said, ah, you mean you've been with me and you've not known the Father? He said, whoever have seen me have seen the Father. So if you want to see the Father, look at the Son. Hope you know you've never seen yourself. Are you aware you've never seen yourself? I have seen you, but you have never seen yourself before. If you want to see yourself, look at the mirror. The mirror is the proof of your... You know when you go out, the confidence you have, you think you are beautiful. It's the information the mirror gave you. <laughs> you are actually walking based on the information of the mirror. It's what the mirror told you your face looked like that you now know. And then you are forming and acting big game. Your, your confidence is built by the mirror. You have never seen yourself. <laughs> <It's not laughs> the son is the means to the father. That's why I say I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the father except by me. So if you want to have a relationship with the father, you must have a relationship with the son. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 1, he said, in the beginning was the the scriptures, see, see. He said, God who had some times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the father by the son, he said, has spoken unto us in this last day by his son. I now begin to tell you the criteria of the son. He said, who been the brightness of his glory? The word glory is the word doxa. Glory simply means the full expression of a reality. The word translated glory is from the word statue. Do you see a statue? If it's standing under the sun, it's, it remains the way it is. Under the rain, it remains the way it is. Set it on fire, it remains the way it is. It is the full, complete, unaltered expression of a substance or of a reality. So he said the sun is the brightest expression of the fullness of the Father. So the Father who is the source of all things is communicated by the sun. And that is why when you receive eternal life, which is the life of the Father, you only receive the Son. When you receive the Son, you have eternal life. It's a system in God. And then you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You remember I told you the Son is the substance, right? The substance of reality. The Son is the administrator of all the purposes of the Father, right? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. These are not three persons, actually. Or better see, these are three persons in one. Are we together? So they are, this, it's, a, it's the same, I'm trying to use the English is deficient in this matter. <laughs> you see, why, why are you talking about God? English, English language is a challenge. It's a challenge. That's why most times Jesus had to use metaphors, 
you know, to communicate these things. There, it's a body to use English language. Languages like Greek and Hebrew, they are a bit deeper, you know, to explain some of these things. But English, English is a body. But God will help us. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, right? Is the third person of the Godhead. But I want to explain the Holy Ghost to you in terms of information trafficking. The Holy Spirit is the experience of God. The experience. The experience of God. Whatever the Son is to you, the means by which you can enjoy it, feel it, and experience it is by the Holy Spirit. That's why, let me give you an example. When you gave your heart to Christ, you received the power of God. But many persons cannot walk in the power of God. Because what will make it an experience is the Holy Spirit. All of us receive healing when we got saved. But many of us are sick. So the question is not whether you are healed or not. If you ask God, He will say you are all the Christians in the world are healed. But if you come on earth, over 70 are sick. The difference between the substance within you and the experience of that substance is a bridge called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what brings you into the experience of the substance of God that you have in your spirit. Without the Holy Ghost, the experience of that which God is in you by the Son can never find expression. So, healing is in you in the sight of God, but for you to walk in healing, you must have a relationship with the Holy Ghost. That's why a lot of people talk so much about God, but they cannot demonstrate it. The demonstration of God is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that networks God into you. You will have the fullness of God in your spirit, but you can never experience His reality. You have all the power of God, you will never experience His reality unless you cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He is the one that works God into your experience. He is the experience of God. So the Father is the fullness of all things. The Son is the substance of the Father's reality, the essence of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the experience of the Father. Let me use a scripture to explain what I've been saying. Matthew chapter 16, from verse 16 to 18. You see what happened in a very short episode. Jesus said, who do men say I am? And the apostles began to bring the suggestions of the scholars of their days. You know, in the days of Jesus, you can't just stand up now, the way we stand up now on Facebook, and you say, the power of God is only available to a man who fasts and pray. And then people begin to share, people begin to share. You can't talk like that in those days. Those days, you only communicate what has been debated and accepted from a school of knowledge. You know, when John stood up in the wilderness and began to baptize, the Pharisees came to him. He said, by what authority are you doing what you are doing? It's just like these university systems. You can't just wake up one day and say, people should come to school, you want to start a working degree. You don't have the stature. Until NUC accredits the university and gives you the authority to do that. You can't just stand up and say, I, I know how to treat them. No, no, no. You can't do the hospital. You must be accredited. So, the schools of thought of those days, headed by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, were the ones that give validation to knowledge. So, anything that is not validated by them will not be regarded in the public setting as a body of truth. So, when Jesus said, Who do men say I am? The disciples were telling Jesus all of the conclusions of the bodies of knowledge that existed in that time. And they say, some say you are Jeremiah's. That means they sat down, they studied his life, the way he spoke, the things he did. They now say, no, this is the spirit of Jeremiah. And then they use scriptures to prove that Jesus was Jeremiah. They say, some say you are John the Baptist. Because they wondered, they saw the guy too, and they said, no, because John came back from the dead, he came with supernatural powers. So it was a conclusion of the school of thought. And some say, well, we cannot 
necessity or certain to say he is any of the prophets. But we know they must be one of the prophets. And when all of them spoke, they were all wrong. So, when you deal with spiritual business, your mind is limited. Spiritual truths and realities don't operate at the economy of reason. No matter how you gather the facts and brainstorm, you'll be wrong, even if there are hundreds of you. A whole generation got it wrong. You know, nowadays you say, um, is these people that said it? And they had a conference of bishops. It's from the conference of bishops that they concluded that this thing is true. A whole generation can be wrong. And you will see why that is possible. You will see why intellectualism and cerebrality cannot pass the test of spirituality. Because without the impute of the Holy Spirit, everything you do is ends in futility. The whole body of knowledge that were available for a generation were wrong. And a man just spoke by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And one sentence was more efficacious than the conclusion of theologians and doctors of the law in the whole generation. Because he spoke by his spirit. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus quickly said, Kai, this answer that you gave did not come from the, the hall of intelligence. This answer that you came is not a product of human reasoning. You have entered into another dimension. It is by the agency of spiritual possibilities that these answers could emanate from you. This is not a product of human reasoning. You have spoken by the voice of an immortal. This utterance that came from you is not the utterance of a mortal entity. You have spoken. Something happened. And Jesus began to show us the dynamics of that utterance. Why that utterance was a possibility. He said, my father, which is in heaven, have revealed this to you. That means revelation is sourced from the Father. Jesus opened our eyes to understand that everything that has its foundation in eternity proceeds from the Father. He said, this was revealed to you by my Father, which is in heaven. You didn't speak from any other source. You spoke only from the source of all things. So the Father, according to Jesus, is the source of all things. And Jesus began to show his own impute. He now began to educate the man. Because that you say you are the Christ does not mean you know it. He only quoted the phrase. He now began to tell him the meaning of that revelation. You know you can come and say you even see healing. You, you talk about healing. But it doesn't mean you know it. Until the son adds his own impute. The impute of the father is that he provides the reality. But it is the son that will substantiate the reality. So Jesus began to explain to him the meaning of what he received from the father. Because he said Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God. He didn't know what it meant. And Jesus said, this thing you have said has an implication. That's where the influence of the son comes. This thing you have said has an implication. The implication of this thing you have said is that the church have appeared in the world. This your revelation is a spiritual strategy Every time a reality will be built on earth that we have an eternal scope, it must first of all come from the realm of the spirit. And it is this type of strategy that will become the basis for the church to be built. So Jesus revealed that that statement he made is the foundation of the church. Peter didn't know he was talking about the church. He just felt he was defining a personality. Meanwhile, the implication was deeper. Jesus was revealing to Peter that what you are saying is what the church will be built why I came to this world is to establish a church so that my body can be operational in the earth realm. But it's the architectural intelligence that will create my body on the earth is this revelation that you brought. The church is what you have built now. So the statement Peter made was the building block of the church. He didn't know what that meant until the son gave him insight. You know, God can tell you you are a prophet. And because God says you are a prophet, everything that will make you a prophet has already been downloaded. But you will not walk in it until the word of the Lord instructs you. The word of the Lord will tell you, this is how you do it. This is what you do. Wake up in the night and pray. Every Friday fast. Pray for five hours so that your spirit will be strong. Don't go to talk to this person. The word of God will give you a lot of instruction so that you can come to a place where the possibility of the prophetic can flow out of you. The Father provides the resource. The Son substantiates the resource. 
Most of us receive revelation, but we don't go to the sun to substantiate it. So we run around on the street and say, an angel appeared to me and say, I am an apostle. There is a complex system of information trafficking in the spirit. If you only receive from the Father, you can never enter into manifestation. Because that Peter said you are the Christ or don't mean the church has appeared. The church didn't appear because Peter caught the revelation. That's why everything God has told you will not appear just because you caught the revelation. The son must have his own impute. The impute of the son is what creates that possibility. And then the Holy Ghost comes in. It is the impute of the Holy Ghost that brings the manifestation. Hope you know even with the whole explanation of Jesus and then his death on the cross did not translate to anything. The day the church was born was the day the Holy Ghost showed up. This is how it works. The father can come and tell you, I use this example all the time, and tell you the symptom of malaria. Maybe you are healing evangelist. And then the father comes and says, the symptom of malaria is weakness of the body, is high fever, is sore throat, and then you say, oh, 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 oh. So you go and say, this is malaria. When somebody has malaria, there is high fever, there is sore throat, there is weakness of the body. You who is saying it, hope you know you don't know what malaria is. You're only talking about it. Then the son will come and tell you, if a man has malaria, he will not just have all these symptoms. He will actually be immobilized. And then he will tell you, for you to have malaria, you must first of all contact. What's the name of the, of the flu from the mosquito now? Those of you who are doctors. Plasmodium. Plasmodium falciparum. He said, must enter into your body and when it enters into your body, it will contaminate your blood. And then you have malaria. Ah, you have gotten a deeper insight. But when the Holy Ghost shows up, and the Holy Ghost wants to teach you about malaria, the Holy Ghost will inject you with plasmodium falciparum. <laughs> so, you will not talk about sore throat. You will have sore throat. You will not talk about weakness. You will become weak. You will not talk about high fever. You will have high fever. That's the difference. The Father provides the reality. The Son substantiates it. But the Holy Ghost brings the experience. The Holy Ghost brings the experience. Before you can move in the prophetic, you may know about the prophetic. You may know you are a prophet. You may even receive the instruction of fasting and prayer. But before you flow in the word of knowledge, the Holy Ghost must whisper. The Holy Ghost must talk. The Holy Ghost is the one that brings the experience. So you must relate with the Holy Spirit every day of your life. That is why I told you that life is a function of progressive yielding to the instructions of the Holy Ghost. If you don't yield to the Holy Ghost, there is no hope for living. You may have a high calling with God. You may have a high destiny with God. But walking in it is a function of your yieldedness to the progressive instructions of the Holy Spirit. It's a system in the spirit realm. The system of information traffic. Before we come for meetings, sometimes we pray for hours. We are not praying for hours so that God can do something. He did everything in Christ Jesus. We are praying for hours so that we will be able to conduct the possibilities of those things that He has already created in Jesus. Before the healing service in the evening, we will go and lie on the floor and pray. We will roll on the floor and cry. You won't see that one. That one is the back, is the dirty job. But the reason we are doing it is so that our soul can ascend. Because the things of God, they operate at different energy levels. And if your soul does not ascend, even though it's available, you cannot have it. It's locked up in your spirit, or it's at an energy level. And your soul must ascend to touch that energy level. But those of you that understand a little bit of chemistry, you will know that electrons operate at different orbitals, and different orbitals are at different energy levels. When you absorb energy, when an electron absorbs energy, it excites to a higher energy level. When you go to pray, what you are doing is that you are receiving a higher supply of the spirit so that your soul can ascend and make contact with reality. It's a system of information traffic. Most of you pray for healing, you are crying, Lord, heal me. You are already healed in Christ. But how to download it into your body? Your body is the one that needs the healing. But the healing must be downloaded. Hope you know you can have a phone. And then you log on to YouTube. And you are watching what is happening on YouTube. Before you have it in your phone. So that you can watch it, you must have to download it. 
You have to download the healing into your body. The healing power of God is already available, but we have to download it in the evening. If we don't download it, the people that have the challenge cannot be healed. That's why we cooperate with the Holy Spirit because He is the substance of the experience of God. You may know all the doctrine, but you will not have the experience unless you know the Holy Ghost as a person. I did a teaching the other time. You know, hey. See, let me tell you something. We have made Christianity a religion. That's why most of you struggle with rules. My brother, this is not about rules. This is about life. Which rule did you obey to wake up in the morning? The protocol of life was at work in you. So when you slept and it was morning, you woke up. <laughs> it's the system in the spirit. But many don't know it. When we say cooperate with the Holy Ghost, we are actually telling you to live. Because you don't live unless you cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And then how do you participate? Your body is a complex being. You, you are a very complex being. <laughs> you don't know who you are. You are a very complex being. Everything God wants you to have, you already have. When you receive Jesus Christ. The Bible said he has given us everything that pertained to life and godliness. Everything that but everything and it's not an exaggeration. Everything. But it is through the epignosis. It is through the experiential walking of those things that you can walk in the reality of those things that you already have. You want healing? It's already there. But it's not a mental thing. You want power? It's already there. It's not a mental thing. Your system is complex. There is something you must do to your system for it to flow. Because what you have in your spirit, in your spirit, you will not experience it. Hope you know, I told you yesterday that God created the spirit. He formed the body. But he didn't do anything about the soul. The soul became. I told you that yesterday. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he said, let us make man in our own image. After our likeness. And he said, in the likeness of him, he made man. Male and female, he made them. Right? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, he said, and God formed the man out of the dust of the ground. The word used in Genesis 1, 26 is the word bara. It means to create out of nothing. That means the man came from within God. And God is not a substance of matter. The word used in Genesis 2, 7 is the word asar. That means to create out of existing material. Your body came from the dust. It came out of existing material. Your spirit came from God. It doesn't exist in this world. And when the body and the spirit came together, the Bible says man became a living soul. What it means is that information can traffic from your spirit into your soul and manifest. Because the soul is the region of manifestation. Information can travel from your body into the soul and manifest. When we break you, where you respond is in your soul. When you receive a revelation from heaven, where it manifests is in your soul. What you are giving as word of knowledge and you are speaking in articulate English did not come to you in English. It came in spirit language. But it's in your soul that it was given expression. Hope you know when Paul was on his way to Damascus and Jesus spoke from heaven. The people that traveled with Paul, they saw light and they heard a sound. But what Paul was hearing was interpreted to him in his soul. The other people did not have interpretation. So they heard a sound. But Paul was hearing, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul was talking to what other people were calling sound. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. He said, it is hard to kick against the priest. All this intelligent language was going on. But people were hearing sound. Because their soul was not granted the permission for interpretation. Jesus stood and he said, now a voice spoke from heaven. And some people say, ah, a thunderhead. Who told you it's thunder? The other one said, an angel spoke to him. And Jesus said, ah, ah, this word came for you. But unfortunately, the people could not interpret. But for me, this is what it means. Now is the judgment of this world. 
now is the prince of the cosmos cast out and I, if I be lifted up I will draw all men to myself that was where Jesus received the strategy for his purpose the strategy of fulfilling the mandate of the father was to die on the cross that was the day Jesus received him but people said what? he turned that so much can be happening in the spirit but because you don't you have not trained your soul to be able to interpret you will be lost even the day some somebody may be sick the day the healing power came he did not understand what was happening so he just allowed the power to dissipate and then he continues in his sickness the power came but he could not download it but the bible says strong meat it belonged to them who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern to discern the key word is to discern but for you to discern you must first of all exercise your senses let me tell you let me show you how your body is built let me show you the the anatomy and the physiology of human makeup because you may not understand you think these things are coincidences there is nothing that is a coincidence your spirit is made up of your conscience it's made up of your communion and it's made up of your intuition. If you read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22, the Bible said by the blood it will purge our heart from an evil conscience. Your spirit is made up of your conscience. Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14, Paul said the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the spirit be with you. Where do you receive the communion of the spirit? First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17, him that is joined with the Lord is one spirit. And it's in your intuition that you receive spiritual signals. Your spirit is made up of your conscience, your communion, and your intuition. Your conscience is what keeps your spirit man upright before God. That's why the Bible said, even your faith will be wrecked if your conscience is defied. He said, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have shipwrecked their faith. That means if your conscience is maligned, your faith is useless. Because your conscience is what gives you an upright posture before God. It's a functional operational part of your spirit. The communion is what causes you to have intimacy with the Holy Ghost. And the intuition is what makes you to receive and to understand spiritual realities. Your soul is made up of your mind your will and your emotion it is in your mind that your memory, your reasoning and your intellect is housed that's why every processing you do you process in your mind it is in your emotion that you feel the flavors of life everything that your mind interprets the, 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 the flavor of it it's your emotion that hosts it. So I can say to you, see your head. And then you smile because you thought I was admiring your hair. You have a clean cut. And then I can say, see your head. And then you know that I've insulted you. And then you feel bad. So it's the same sentence, different interpretation, different emotional response. Your emotion is a function of the processing of your mind. So it's not necessarily about what you hear. It's about the interpretation of what you hear. That's why info, that's how information are trafficked. Same utterance, different interpretation, different emotional response. And then your will is the region of action. It's your will that causes your actions and your inactions. See your head. Even though you feel bad, you may say, if I talk back, it will not be good since he's a pastor and he's preaching. But if we are outside and I say, see your head, they'll say, are you alright? <laughs> so you took an action based on your, your judgment. Your soul is made up of your mind, your emotion, and your will. And then your body. You have five senses in your body. Biologically. But um, these five senses are actually modified. You know the sense of sight, the sense of hearing, the sense of smelling, the sense of touch, and the sense of um, taste. When was the last time you did something because of taste? When you dress well and you want everybody to see you, is it because of hearing? 
or when you came that day you came with your father's jeep and you wanted to park in the field where the whole students are doing sport and then you drove and screeched just to cause attention is it because of smell <laughs> there is something the fall did to our senses it remodified our senses and our senses became a faculty of lust so most of the things we did we do in the flesh are motivated by lust the lust of the eyes the lust of the flesh and the pride of life it is the lust of the eyes that controls every action you take based on human intelligence you do that in order to satisfy some form of gratification that is a product of the fallen man it is the lust of the flesh that motivates everything we do for our appetite and satisfaction. The reason the young lady will go and have sex because she needs money is because she wants to put on a Brazilian hair so that everybody in the class will know that she's the happening girl. She wants to buy the latest iPhone, not because she loves the iPhone, because when she's at home in the hostel, she throws the iPhone somewhere. But when she's coming to the class, she needs to hold the iPhone because there is a lust in her that needs to be satisfied. So she didn't sleep with a man because she loves sex. She didn't sleep with a man because she has no self-control. She slept with that man because there is a pride of life controlling her. When she gets home, she doesn't even know where the iPhone is. But if she wants to go out, she must hold the iPhone in her hands. Because everybody has got to see her that she's the one with the latest iPhone 9. <laughs> Your body is made up of three senses. The lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh. And the pride of life. This is how these four, this, this is how these three sets of senses operate. For you to receive, remember, your soul is the region of what? Manifestation, right? That's why you, we are called persons. Do you know why we are called persons? Because we are personalities. Personality simply means your faculty that gives expression to your essence. When we say this is your personality, we are actually talking about the manifestation of who you are your real essence its form of manifestation is what we call your personality and that is a cardinal operational part of your body called your soul so everything that is happening in your spirit we will not know it until we see it happen or manifest by the operation of your soul remember Mary had an encounter with God and she went to Elizabeth her cousin and when she came to Elizabeth and after the salutation, she made a statement. She said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in the God of my salvation. Do you know what happened there? What Mary was saying, my soul doth is present tense. My spirit hath is past tense. So what Mary was saying is that, my spirit rejoiced in the Lord long before now. But I didn't know what it means. It is now that I understand what the rejoicing is. The rejoicing that my spirit was having in the Lord. Now the interpretation is my soul is that my soul is magnifying the Lord. So when something happens in the spirit, it is trafficked through your soul and it is manifested. When you have an encounter with God, it is manifested through your soul. And this is a channel of manifestation. The intuition is the intelligent part of your spirit. If your intuition picks something from the realm of God, the only way your soul can catch it is through your mind. So those informations are interpreted to your mind. So your mind is the connection to your intuition. What your spirit receives from God, the knowledge your spirit receives from God, is your mind that processes it. What you call word of knowledge, you call the name John. Uh, that name is not called like that in the spirit. You remember Jesus said, I will give you a new name that no man know it. There's a spiritual name. Oh, have you, you understand computer sciences? You know binary numbers. When you write Peter on the computer, what is actually written in the computer is 0011021. They are in zeros and in ones. But when you write Peter, you think it's Peter. The computer is interpreting 00101001111. That's what Peter is in the computer language. But it has to be decoded for you. So when your spirit picks something in your intuition, your mind interprets it and it calls it, The Lord loves me. The Lord told me to go to Lagos and start an apostolic work. The Lord has told me to start a business of pure water. Jesus did not mention pure water. Jesus spoke in spirit language, but your mind interpreted pure water. So the reason you came to Igbenidion University and you started a fellowship is not because Jesus said Igbenidion. It's not because Jesus said fellowship. Jesus may have spoken. But you heard Igbenidion. You heard fellowship. You heard JCCF. 
it was not pronounced in heaven as Tesis here. It was little hombres kafiri are in the heart. Baragira under the Sabdoa, the Labandre Silora has this ash. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. You must eat along the truth. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. He was seated on the throne. Do you know why we worship Him all the time? Because we have judged. We looked at ourselves and we judged and we discovered there is nothing in us that has value. The only thing that has value is Christ in me, the hope of glory. I checked. I checked, I checked. I thought I was intelligent. In my university days, I was a scholar. I was a university scholar. But when I stepped out, I realized my certificate counted for nothing. My certificate, if, if my BSc does not count for anything. My master's count for nothing. Even the PhD I'm doing now counts for nothing. Because there is no chemistry in apostolic writing. I am an apostle of Jesus. And chemistry does not have a part to play in apostolic. I checked myself. Everything that I call a natural advantage. When I looked at the handwriting of my destiny. It did not add an impute. Because when my destiny was written. By the finger of fire. In the archives of heaven. There was nothing written about my natural ability. God was speaking. And he said Michael. On earth you will depend on me to speak. You will depend on me to think. It will depend on me to walk because it is in me that you live, it is in me that you have your being. You have no value without me. That is why every morning I rise up, I say, Glory to the Lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. Even the ones that live in the heights of the heaven, the Bible said, The 20 and 4 elders they fell from their throne, they cast their crown, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The four beasts that stand before him, he said, day and night without ceasing, they cry, holy, holy, holy. Because when we checked, the last time we checked, creation has no value apart from God. There's no value in creation apart from God. You pride yourself in your looks. Someday, your beautiful face will be buried in the grave. You pride yourself in your intelligence. The day your life is threatened, you understand that your reasoning powers does not have the ability to save your life. Man does not live by breath. We are not moved by the things that happen because it's not given to man that walketh to water his steps. Everything about us was encoded in the very heights of Zion. There is an archive in heaven where your destiny was written. You are not called to be creative. You are called to be obedient. Your life is a story that God is telling from heaven. Every step you take is a statement on the tongue of the immortal one. Jesus never stepped out until the spirit spoke because he knew how these things work. Most of us take steps every morning because we think we are intelligent. You are creating a set of contradictions that will affect you in the days to come. That club you went to yesterday, that is what will result in a pregnancy. That is what will result in an abortion. And you didn't know the devil was setting you up never to have a successful marriage. When they were removing your womb, you never knew it would end like that. You thought it was a one night stand where you would get the money to make your hair. You never knew your womb was being packaged. When Satan operates in your direction, he is considering your future. You are the one killing your future and sacrificing it on the altar of temporary pressure. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh. Kadosh. You are mighty. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your feet. You reign, you ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty.
I love worshiping God much more than preaching. You see, when I'm preaching, you are being blessed. Yeah, sometimes I feel the anointing. I enjoy it. But when I worship God, my essence, everything pours out like a river. I feel God. I feel God. It's like the river that makes it glad, the city of God. If we had our way, when I come for service, we'll worship God for one hour and preach for 15 minutes and move in power for 15 minutes. I love worshiping God. Can you look to heaven now and give thanks? Maybe you have judged your mind and you see it's futile. You have seen that your body can take you nowhere. You have seen that your father is the governor, but your destiny has nothing to do with him. Hey! Kadosh, Kadosh, you are my. of heaven. The way you sleep and wake up, that's why, that's how righteous living in heaven is a natural thing. But you don't know it, so they are giving to you as a set of rules. When you allow life to begin to flow through you, those things will no longer be a rule. It will be a culture of life. That's why the Bible said, against law, there is no law. But this is how you make life to work. The Holy Ghost is the bandwidth of life. The bandwidth of life. The data of life is transmitted in the Holy Spirit. How does your will work? Your will. It works by a good conscience. Did you notice the last time you did something and then you were restless? You were troubled. You lied to the person. Or you hurt the person. And your conscience will not let you rest. You say, go and apologize. Go and apologize. You want to be healthy in the spirit? you must apologize. Because if you don't, what you are doing is that you are searing your conscience with a hot iron. When your conscience dies, your life has ended. Because nothing you do will be recorded in heaven anymore. Because in heaven, the only things that will pass through the gate of eternity is the things you do by faith. And the Bible said, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have shipwrecked their faith. So when your conscience dies, your faith is shipwrecked. What you are doing may be passion and zeal, it's not faith. And it will not appear in the regions of Zion. I spoke to you about spiritual readers yesterday. You may be doing so much on earth, but in heaven they are not seeing it. They are not seeing it. They will be wondering what's happening. They can't feel you. This thing I'm speaking, if you look at the amplifier, signals are moving. Signals. Signals. When your heart is beating, signals are moving on the machine. When the signals stop moving, even if you are alive, the doctor will say you are dead. Because there's no pulse anymore. When your conscience dies, your faith has no pulse in heaven. So you may be doing things that think you are pleasing God. They are not seeing the pulse in heaven. Hope you know if you lie down when you are in coma. The reason they still say you are alive is not because if you see somebody who is in coma, you can say he's dead. But the doctor says he's alive. Why? Because there is pulse. Sometimes they can't even feel the pulse at the wrist. But the machine is reading the pulse. They will wait. But the day the pulse stops, even if you cough, oh, they will say, bury him, he's dead. When your conscience is shipwrecked, you don't have, you cannot appear in the radars of heaven. Your conscience is the regulator of your action. The, health, the strength of your will 
is predicated on a good conscience. So you cannot da- you cannot download the dimension of righteousness unless your will is perfectly aligned with your conscience. Righteousness is a function of the alignment of the will with the conscience. The moment the conscience is compromised, there's no righteousness. The moment your will is disaligned, there's no righteousness. Your conscience is the dimension of you that the Holy Ghost traffics the righteousness of God through. And that is why your conscience regulates your action. It is the system of information trafficking in the spirit. How does your emotion work? Do you know you need to purge your emotions? You don't know. Do you know why sometimes we just stay in the presence of God? We just stay there. We just stay there. Because some of us, our emotions have been infected with viruses. I was telling you about the background technology yesterday. How that you cannot see me on the altar unless you see the background. Some of the things you have done before, the experience of seeing you had, they have, they have injected virus in your emotion. If you want your emotion to be purged, you need to stay in the presence of God for a long time. Do you know why most times when the power of God is moving, people are overwhelmed? People are overwhelmed because their emotions, the Holy Ghost comes strong on their emotions and they can't bear it. Their brain can no longer interpret what's happening. So they just collapse. That's the system of God too, to reconfigure their emotions. Sometimes you came with lust and then people fall down and they rise up and lust has gone. They don't know when it stopped. But they just discovered lust is no longer there. The guy who every day has strange appetites, he wants to drink star or more lager beer. He came for a meeting. They didn't talk about more. They didn't talk about drunkenness. But the power of God came on him. He collapsed. He woke up. And then he didn't have appetite for more anymore. Uh, what's happened? Me, personally, I was a football fan, a crazy fan. Where we were crazy fans. If you, if you, if you call us now, you have touched my sensitive part. We were not winning trophies, but you can't win us in an argument. Hey, hey, hey. this tongue has served many functions before it started serving Jesus. We will argue for three hours. You can't. Even when I was writing my Wayek, I had chemistry the next day, and they were writing champ, they were playing Champions League finals. That was in 2006. Arsenal and Barcelona, we were there. <laughs> Man, we were slaves. And suddenly I went for a meeting. And Apostle Adam was preaching. The English was so complex. But I was just understanding, enjoying the intensity of God. Because when you hear him, something is happening to your heart. You may not understand, but your heart is heavy. Your heart, the man deposits God in your heart. He puts God inside your heart. The particles of God are deposited. And the power of God moves so strongly. And I was overwhelmed. When I went to the house, the next day there was March. We changed and we went. I sat in the studio. I was sleeping throughout. Uh, what's happening? The desire was dying. I will be looking like this and be dozing. Ah, me? And in this studio, people are shouting from the beginning to the end. How was I able to sleep there? Something had died. I have lost my place in the world. You know, there is a level you walk with God that even if you go back to the dear father, you have lost your place. You don't have a place there anymore. The Bible said concerning Lucifer, he said there is no place found. You go back to where your guys, you don't have a place. They are drinking beer, you sat with them, you put a bottle of beer, but you don't have a place. They will not even notice you are there. You have lost your place. I was sleeping in the studio. And then the next time they had match, I said, I'm tired. And I didn't watch match again till today. The, the, the team died. You know what happened? The Holy Ghost walked on my appetite. He walked on my emotions. You know why we don't fight against cleaning anointing? People make a religion out of it now. So most times, when I come for a meeting, I say, you mustn't fall down. You mustn't, but uh, you can't stop it. It's an operation of the Holy Spirit. From the first day, even before I started ministry, people were falling down. It's the operation of the Holy Ghost. You don't know what the Lord is doing with them. But most of the times, if God wants to deal with your emotions, He overwhelms you. He overwhelms you so that he can have all your attention. That was what he did to Adam to remove the reed. God wanted to form Eve out of Adam. But the distraction would not let God rest. God is trying to say, come, let me remove your reed. He said, this is lion. 
I want the lion to have authority over here on the animals. Isn't it? If you go under the, the, the ocean, there is a fish there called shark. Eh, God is not talking about shark. They want to create Eve now. Adam is still calling animals. So God had to touch him. And he was overwhelmed. When he laid down there, God removed his rib and formed Eve. The purpose and the destiny that God has planted in you, sometimes if he wants to bring it out of you, he has to slay you. Because you know so much. You know so much. God is saying, give all the money you have in your pocket. And then you are telling God, there's a widow close to my house. The husband is dead. She has four children. Instead of giving this money, I need to pay, give her part of this money to pay school fees. If that boy's school fees is paid, he will become irresistible. God said, give all the money. That one is not your part. It's his part. But most times, because our mind do not allow God to praise, what happens? We are slain. He came for the service, he's watching. Let me see what this man of God has. What can he do? Let's see. Why you are saying, what can he do? Then something knocks you, you go down. Because you are trying to rob yourself of your blessing. That's how God deals with the emotion. He purges your emotion. The psalmist said, and the Lord restored my soul. It's a system of information trafficking. The bandwidth of life flowing through the Holy Ghost can only get through you when the chambers of your soul are connected to your spirit. Your mind connects your intuition. Your will connects your conscience. And your emotion connects the communion of the spirit. The unfortunate thing is that that's not the only direction that information travels. This is where the demonic realm comes in. And if I explain the demonic, I will tell you why we always talk about the sacrifice of alignment. Because when we talk about the sacrifice of alignment, we are not saying pay the price to, for anything. Jesus paid the price for everything. We are only saying pay the price for the experience of the things Jesus has paid for. We are only saying pay the price to get your soul consistently aligned with your spirit. Because your soul can also align with your body. Alignment is the connectivity of the soul to the spirit against the body. It's the price you pay. There are other means of traffic. You know, the Bible said something. Are you learning something this morning? Let me read the scripture for you. First Corinthians 2. Corinthians 2 verse 12. He said, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. There are two things you need to get from this scripture before we proceed. First, there are two spirits that you can receive. You can receive the Holy Ghost and you can also receive the spirit of the world. And he says something. He said that we might. That's a contrasting phrase. If the Holy Spirit reveals to you the things of God, that means the spirit of the world forbids you from knowing the things of God. The Holy Ghost causes you to traffic in the Godward direction. The spirit of the world causes you to traffic against the Godward direction. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 3 and see what the Bible says it said but if our gospel be hid are you seeing what I'm telling you so the spirit of, of the world can rob you of the knowledge of God the same way the Holy Ghost can make available to you the knowledge of God he said if our gospel be hid it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world have blinded, have blinded their hearts, have blinded their minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, will shine. So the spirit of the world causes you to travel in another side of knowledge, the knowledge that is not the knowledge of God. In First John chapter 2 verse 14, the Bible says, love not the world. 
He said, they that love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. He said, what is in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That means, the direction you follow by the spirit of this world that makes you not to receive the knowledge of God is the direction of lust. When we talk about the eyes, we talk about intelligence. So the lust of the eyes connects to your mind. The things you see, the things you perceive from the world, they are the intelligence system that will corrupt the operational dimension of your mind. That is why they tell you that every pastor wants to collect money from people. That's the ideology of the world. So when you want to give, the Holy Ghost says give. And then your faith moves, you want to give. And you now hear that kind. These pastors, they say that they collect money. And then you check. And you carry the smallest amount. What is happening? Another kind of intelligence. Making you to become rebellious to the Holy Spirit. Have you not known why most of you are afraid of the dark? Have you ever seen a spirit before? But they told you that evil spirits are in the dark. So every time you are in the dark, oh boy, come, come, let's go outside. The intelligence of the world. They tell you, if you are not fair, you will not be attractive. So 70% of the ladies, they are combining seven creams to look fair. <laughs> Meanwhile, it is not beauty that makes you marry. It is favor. So instead of traveling in the direction of favor, they are traveling in beauty. So they rub all the foundations and the mascara. When they are 33 years old, then they come to the altar and lay down. All I am is yours. All I am. No. All you are is for foundation. Now foundation have failed. They thought when they were growing up, they are seven friends. Every time they are going anywhere, they are in the middle because they are the boss queen. Now all the ugly girls are married. The next time they had meeting, they came with three of their children. So it becomes a shame. The boss queen now becomes the heat queen. The lust of the eyes. They do all kinds of things to receive the approval of people. The lust of the eyes. Those things corrupt your soul because they bring new ideologies to your mind. And your soul has no opinion, your soul is only a processor. You see, your, your laptop can be processing information. If you put a virus there, your laptop will process the virus. Because your laptop is what? A processor. That's how the soul works. Your mind is a processor. You are here now, you are a prayer warrior. You think, ah, sin can, ah, sin can have dominion over me. The reason sin can have dominion over you is because you are constantly beholding the Lord. If you begin to behold pornography, in the next two months, you will be in the dark. Walking towards the girls' campus. The soul is a processor. And that's still why we talk about the sacrifice of alignment. I'm not talking about righteousness because I cannot be thrown down. I'm talking righteousness because I know in this life I'm sentenced to God only. So I can't fall, not because I'm strong, but because God in me is strong. If you begin to behold another, you become. It's a law of the spirit. What you see, you become. You know, God said to Moses, He said, No man will look at me and leave. Moses thought it was death. It's not death. If you see God, you become like Him. It was John that revealed it. He said, As we behold Him, we are changed. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, He said, What manner of love have the Father bestowed upon us that we should become the Son of God? He said, It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as it is, as he is. If you see the devil, you become like the devil. Constantly behold the things of the devil, you become the devil. And you constantly behold God, you become God. Because we all with unveiled faces, beholding us in the glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. The devil corrupts the vistas of your physical sight so that you can see things and interpret them through the lust of the eyes. And that's why most of us, our souls are corrupt. People come to me, they say, they can't live a holy life. Nobody can the reason we are living holy lives is because we can behold God. So the question is not trying to be holy. The question is keeping your focus on God and holiness become a natural byproduct. You are on Facebook every day looking at all the ladies that post naked pictures and you want to live a holy life. How? 
They say club. There's a party today. You say, well, me, I don't go to party. But you sit in front of your hostel. And all the ladies going on bomb shot. You are looking at them. I don't go to party. You are the, the, the most deceived man in the century. We all with unveiled faces. What you see, you become. It's the intelligence of information traffic. The lust of the flesh. What you touch controls you. What you see, you have the sister. Please, I want to keep it calm. What you see, you become. What you touch controls you. The lust of the flesh. That's why the devil is pushing you. If you know the number of demons that are whispering to you, you think you are the one thinking. Hey, he said, call her now, call her, call her. Yes, now she is expecting your call. Don't you know she wants to hear your voice? Then it would remind you. See that time you saw her in the afternoon. See the way she smiled. You are not thinking, no. If the spirit realm opens, you will see four demons whispering. You don't know how demons work. The Bible said the devil roams like a roaring lion. These guys are on assignment on your life. <laughs> you don't know the demons that are, are on your matter. Call her, call her. You think you are thinking. Who told you? When you have exam to write, you are not thinking exam. You are thinking when the lady smiled last two weeks. And you think you are that intelligent. If you are that intelligent, why don't you understand and remember what the lecturer says? One sentence in class you can't remember in the exam. And then the lady that smiled at you three weeks ago among ten ladies, you can remember. Who told you you are that intelligent? The spirit realm. They call her, call her. She's smiling. She's waiting for your call. Even yesterday, you, you think she was not telling her friends. That time she was smiling. She was telling her friends about you. See the way your shoe was shining. You are a foolish man. Aka, aka, ya. I got you over the mema, ora mubeya, ena ni ani the mema. Easy he can do, ena ni ni ata ta. I got you over the mema, I got you, I got you, I got you over the mema. The lust of the flesh is a strategy of enslaving you forever. When you become a slave of your senses, you are perpetually gone. God knows. That's why he said we live by faith, not by sight. The word sight is sensory perception. Your feelings are a lie. Did you not notice that the things you thought you liked three weeks ago, now you can't even look at them. When I used to be small, I don't like onions. If you give me food, I'll pack all the onions and throw away. Now I'm a king of onions. Because your feelings... It's a lie. You can't live life by feelings. Don't be deceived, brother. Demons are intelligent. They know how you were designed. They know how you were fabricated. The Bible spoke about the principalities. The word principality means first among the ranks. He said they were there when the foundations of the world were sculpted. He said they sank into the fabric of creation. When God was designing you, the angels were already made and most of them fell. They know how you were designed. They know your dimensions. The devil will not tempt me and you to say, because by instrument of, of familiar spirit, they have a data bank of information. The devil knows the temptation that brought your great grandfather down. He knows the one that brought your grandfather down. He knows the one that brought your father down. And he knows that on the strength of DNA encoding, 90% that same temptation will bring you down. Yours may be lost, mine may be pride. Demons are on assignment and it's by the systems of the lust of the flesh. 
That was why Abraham loved fair women. Isaac loved fair women. Jacob loved fair women. It's a transparency of DNA encoding. The lust of the flesh. If you become a man of feelings, you are a slave forever. You walk by faith. It was said in the Old Testament. It was said before Jesus. And it was said after Jesus. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Romans 1 17. Galatians 3 33, 6 13. And Hebrews 13 verse 11. He said the just shall live by faith. Not by feeling. Your feeling. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video. Make sure that you click on the share button. And share to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.